say for somebody who for somebody who is about we'll say 30% body fat to get to 10% body fat that's a that's a much bigger delta mm-hmm. how does one even begin setting down that path of, of achieving that goal really good question because what it takes to get from 15 to 10 uh, is different than what it would take to go from 30 that let's say to 20 okay the leaner you get the more for lack of a better term dialed in and more specific you have to get with the details but when you're 30 percent 30 percent for a man is is pretty high once you get above once you start to get above 20 percent uh, the negative uh, health effects uh, associated with body fat percentage start to happen regardless of fitness level so what's interesting with body fat percentage is that there's a range of body fat percentage where your health could be good um your fitness uh really determines that right so you could be 17 percent body fat or 12 percent body fat but if you're fit and mobile and the foods you're eating are healthy you get good sleep all that stuff your health isn't going to really reflect different one or the other um, but once you surpass 20%, then you start to notice these kind of negative health effects that come from body fat percentage. So 30 is pretty high for a man. And at that point, it's like, okay, I need to bring this body fat percentage down. The changes in your lifestyle that you need to make uh, at 30% are small, and those will start to get the needle moving. Now, someone might be thinking, well, why don't I just do all the stuff that I would need to do at 10%? Uh, right out the gates. Won't that get me there faster? No, uh, because the, the the adaptation process doesn't work that way. You're going to overwhelm your body. You're going to overwhelm your body's ability to um, adapt to both workouts and let's say a calorie deficit. Um, and what will happen is you'll hit a plateau very quickly by doing that. And then uh, behaviorally speaking, it's too much all at once. It's like, you know, I have this lifestyle, I'm gonna switch completely to this other lifestyle overnight. The odds of you um, sticking to that are very, very uh, slim. Mm -hmm. It's hard anyway, but you really are gonna uh, kill yourself if you do all of it all at once. So the first things, if, if someone came to me, now, of course, this can be different from person to person. There's a lot of individual variants. So I'm gonna speak very generally, but let's say the average or general man comes to me, 30% body fat, um, doesn't exercise, uh, doesn't really pay attention to his diet. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on building strength um, in the gym. Okay, so I'm going to have him come in two to three days a week, train with me, and the goal is going to be: Can we first get you so that you feel your body is stable? You've got the uh, prerequisite mobility to be able to do certain exercises. So we'll start with like correctional exercise type stuff. By the way, um, correctional exercise is still strength training. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying that is because sometimes people think like, oh, I don't, I'll skip that part because I want to get there faster. Um, like building a house, if you don't start with the foundation, you're not gonna be able to build a house anyway. So if they, if they came to see me, we're gonna start by building some stability, by building, you know, working on joint integrity, and uh, it's very basic um, kind of movements uh, and basic strength training. And the goal in the beginning is to get you to start to see some good strength gains. Now, strength is a phenomenal metric um, in this case because if you're getting stronger, then we know we're doing a lot of things right. It's hard to get stronger and do a lot of things wrong, okay? So it's a wonderful objective metric, whereas the mirror especially at 30% body fat, isn't a great uh, uh, metric. It, it's, it's too subjective. Like uh, 30, if someone's 30% body fat, they could lose muscle, they could be dehydrated, they could look smaller, but it doesn't necessarily mean they got leaner or they're doing things the right way. But strength, like you're either doing more reps or lifting more weight, or you can, let's say, um, have a better range of motion with better control, which is also more strength. All of those things are like, we're moving in the right direction. What that also does is it starts to uh, change um, insulin sensitivity, um, which has a great effect on our mood, which is gonna help us as we start to fine tune the diet. From a diet perspective, the first thing I'm gonna do with an individual like that is I'm gonna have them try to reduce heavily processed foods because I know that that naturally will get the person to eat less. We've taught you and I have talked about this ad nauseum. So I'll say, okay, um, let's try to avoid heavily processed foods, stick to whole natural foods. And then if I add anything, it's gonna be, I'd like for you to hit your target body weight in grams of protein. And what I want you to do is I want you to prioritize that with each meal, 
Okay, so let's say um, his target uh, body weight is 180 gram, uh, 180 pounds. Then I'll say, okay, we need to eat, uh, let's say 50 grams of protein with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then I'll throw in like 20 or 30 gram protein shake to kind of make up the difference. And I want you to prioritize that. So in other words, when you eat breakfast, eat that first. And then I'm not gonna tell you to worry about anything else. Go ahead if you wanna eat other things, so long as you kind of stay away from the heavily processed food, go for it. Now that also um, has a pretty profound effect on satiety. So mm -hmm. their appetite will naturally regulate itself. The calories will start to drop a little bit, but that extra protein is gonna help fuel the strength and muscle uh, that we're trying to build um, in the beginning. Now, why that's so important is because that as we're moving in the direction of building, we're positively uh, influencing or impacting his metabolic rate. Hmm. So we're going to, uh, to speed up the metabolism to a certain degree, which down the road, this is very valuable because now we have a faster metabolism to work with. And what we don't want to do for someone listening who's going down this path, what you don't want to do is get to the point where you're cutting calories so much over this period and increasing activity so much over this period that you end up at your goal, but now you're working out so much and you're eating so li little that you look at everything, you're like, I can't possibly hmm. maintain this. So it all starts uh, in the very beginning. And then if we attack any additional activity, I'm not having you do anything structured aside from the strength training. I'm just gonna say, um, let's start uh, tracking your steps. Let me see how many steps you take a day. And then I may have you try to increase that through, um, you know, parking your car further in the parking lot, um, using the second floor bathroom, maybe doing a five or 10 minute walk after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But I need to know what your starting point is before I can make those suggestions. And that's where we start. Hmm. That's the very beginning. And then from there, then there's other steps that we start to take along the way to get to the to the ten percent. That's a pretty like low bar. Like mm -hmm. that is not too heavy a lift, especially for somebody just starting out. I mean, no. Like focusing on protein because it's so satiating. It's going to support your your muscular development. You, the increase in steps, right? Increasing mm -hmm. non exercise activity thermogenesis, like just the the normal everyday movements, yep. like just moving your body more. Yeah, I love this. And and now that what that's going to do. And um, you know, I want to be clear with this because people often think there's a trade-off between doing things the right way and then doing things the fast way. Hmm. People think, well, I want to get there fast. I'll, I'll sacrifice some of the right because I'm so eager to get there right now. The truth is the right way gets you there faster and, and in terms of body fat percentage. Now, you could lose weight much faster but you're gonna be losing muscle uh, along the way. Mm. Um, but body fat percentage wise, this is the the fastest and the the way you can do it where you're most likely able to sustain uh, the fat loss. So this is the right way is the best way all, all the way around. What is the What is like a healthy rate of fat loss? That's a very good question. So between, if somebody's doing things pretty consistently, you should see, you can see a fat loss. And I say fat loss because, uh, well, we'll get to that in a second. But you should see fat loss or you could see fat loss at about one to two pounds uh, a week. So one to two pounds of body fat a week. Now I say body fat because that might not show up on the scale, especially if you've never done strength training and you just got started. Typically what happens is you see, and this is what I would, I didn't want to see. So when I would train clients, I don't want to see scale moving down in the beginning because what I wanted to see was a, a transfer or a composition switch. So I would do body fat percentage testing and I'd, mm. and I'd be able to see, okay, the scale shows that your weight's the same, but I see here that you lost three pounds of body fat and gained three pounds of muscle. Now we're really moving in the right direction. They would at also, if you lose three pounds of body fat and gain three pounds of muscle, you're smaller hmm. because body fat takes up more space. But you don't want to necessarily, especially at 30% body fat, you don't want to see the scale go down too quickly because you want to also have that, that muscle gain. So it should stay relatively stable or start to go down slower on the scale uh, probably for the first, I'd say, 30 to 60 days, maybe even 90 days. But you will burn body fat. That doesn't mean you're not losing body fat. Now, when things start to level out with the muscle, about one to two pounds a week is is reasonable, I would say. Although most people are around a half a pound 
uh, of body fat a week. And I'm saying that because most people are not like doing mm-hmm. everything that they, you know, ideal. It typically waxes and wanes with, with some of the stuff that I'm saying. And it's like the leaner you get, the more slowly you uh, you want that weight loss to occur, correct? Because well, the, the risk of muscle loss increases the leaner you get. Mm-hmm. The leaner you get, the more your body's trying to keep it. Mm. Okay, so think of it like a bank account. You got money in the bank. You know, you got a lot of money in the bank. You're spending it, no big deal. Bank account starts to get real slim. I'm really careful now with, you know, how much money I'm spending. Body fat's like a, uh, it's an insurance policy, right? It's your, wow. it's stored energy. Um, so absolutely. And the leaner you get, the, you know, 1% body fat doesn't sound like much. But when you're 10% body fat, if you go down one or go up one, it, you can see it. Yeah. 30%, you're not going to be able to see 1%. Mm-hmm. You're not going to really be able to see it. Doesn't doesn't Visually, you can't tell um, that easily. But that's where I would start. Now, here's where I would go and this is where people are gonna are like what well, that doesn't make any sense and there'll be some controversy around this but if you talk to like real world coaches and trainers um, they'll tell you that this is a much this is a winning strategy most people at this point would say okay now we're gonna start cutting calories um, I don't cut calories uh, I usually start to increase calories at this point so let's say you and I've worked together for, you know, let's say it's 45 days in. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you track your food. Don't change anything. Um, don't really pay attention to much, much except for the protein. Write down what you're eating or enter it into a log. I'm going to look at your average. And then what I'm going to do is increase your calories by, let's say, 150 calories uh, a day. And we'll do that for a week or two. Monitor your progress. And then I'll do it again monitor your progress, and then we'll do it again. So this is known in the fitness space as a reverse diet, Hmm. okay? There's a lot of controversy around a reverse diet because you'll have people saying things like, you can't speed up the metabolism by bumping calories or there's no value in in doing anything like this. Um, We've all done it. We've witnessed it. I've done it with so many different people. You absolutely um, can do it. and it does, but it does require a methodical approach to slowly increasing calories alongside a good strength training program. And mm. what we're doing is we're fueling more strength, fueling more muscle. But the goal of the increasing calories, and at this, this point, I also start to bump the steps up a little bit, the, the non structured exercise activity, because the goal is, and this is different from person to person, uh, it's really interesting, Max. When you look at, um, if you look at someone's metabolic rate and you look at their current lean body mass, even if they don't add or lose lean body mass, there seems to be like a, a range of calories that their body can burn, uh, you know, from the, on the high end to the low end. Um, and it's really interesting. And there's a lot of explanations as to what's going on. Some people say, well, you're just moving more without realizing it. But it is very interesting um, when you when you witness this, is you'll see the, someone's bo- metabolism speed up or slow down within lean body. Now, if you increase lean body mass, it tends to trend obviously um, towards the positive. But my goal is to get the calories to go up, to not see the scale move at all, still see some muscle gain and some fat loss, and then when I get it to a point where I feel comfortable cutting, that's when I do the cut. Because hmm. now I'm at a place where. You know, let's say you come see me and we just get started and you're averaging, you know, 2,400 calories a day and we slowly bump you to, let's say, 2,900 calories a day with no real significant weight gain on the scale. Well, now when it's time to cut calories, I'm cutting from 2,900, hmm. not from 2,400. And we can get you to a place that's uh, much more maintainable. So like you're you're basically like so you're ramping up the me- metabolism, you're you're undoing any potential metabolic adaptation that may have occurred to get them to a higher maintenance level of calories mm-hmm. and then you cut from there. And then we cut from there. Hmm. And again, coaches have done this uh, time and time again, so it's a it's a it's a very real thing. Um, Dr. Lane Norton, good friend of mine, he's probably one of the people that's pioneered uh, kind of what this looks like. Um, and, you know, he's, he's a PhD in nutrition and he's also a bodybuilder and he's worked with many athletes. This, uh, the the range at which or how much you can influence the metabolic rate depends uh, on the individual. But I've done, now working with, on the extreme end, uh, athletes who have chronically dieted, 
you know, I, I remember one person in particular, she did, um, she did like three figure competitions. So figure is like, it's like a stage presentation. It's not bikini, it's more muscle. Hmm. Um, but she did three figure competitions uh, over the span of, uh, I think like nine months, so, which is a lot, because they get shredded. You're looking at, you know, women getting down to 10%. She did that, then she, before that, she trained and competed in a marathon. By the time she came to me, she was uh, strength training uh, most days, running like crazy most days, and consuming about 1,700 calories a day, which is not much considering all the activities she was doing. So she came and saw me, and she says, you know, I'm trying to get ready for another show. My body's just not react; it's not responding like it used to. So for a year, she trained with me, did no competitions. We slowly reverse dieted her. I slowly reduced her activity because she was doing so much before. We focused um, primarily on like strength building. Let's see how strong we can get you. And we got her calories from 1,700 to 2,600. Wow. Uh, with a fraction of the activity. So her body was able to burn that many more calories. And she felt so much better, so much healthier. And then from there, she was able to cut. And it was it was, it was was no problem. Psychologically, was that difficult for her? Because I feel like yes. there's a big psychological hurdle. You you're st- you start eating more, and for somebody who's probably as obsessed as as this competitor mm-hmm. likely was, right? Like, isn't there the fear of of putting on fat? Max, you, you try telling somebody who hires you who wants to lose thirty pounds of body fat, hey, we're going to get stronger, and I'm going to slowly increase your calories, right? This is what I would do with clients, and luckily, I I, I can be very convincing, so I have the, the you know I can I have some sales skills that come <laughs> in handy because I would I would explain this process and build their trust. And then they would trust me and then it would work out uh, really well. So that would be the next phase. And then once we're in a kind of a comfortable place, um, now I'm going to start the cutting process. And this is where we drop the calories below maintenance, usually 500 if their calories are really high. If it's, it's, a, it's a guy and he's eating 3,500 calories, I might drop as much as 800. And we monitor uh, the fat loss from there and how they feel. Now the cut, lasts for as long as I start to see nice consistent progress, their performance is doing well, they feel good, but inevitably what happens is you'll see a plateau at some point or they're gonna feel not as good or they're telling you maybe they're hungry or whatever, in which case I'll bump their calories up a little bit, keep them there for a week or two and then start the process over. Sometimes I have to reverse diet a little bit and then bring it back down um, depending on the individual. And so this is the process that we do over time to get them down to 10%. The closer the person gets down to 10%, the more precise and consistent they need to be with their caloric intake. Hmm. You just have less you just have less flexibility with how, you know, when you can go off. I mean, you know, it's now you're pretty lean if you your body fat percentage could go up much easier now than when you were at let's say 15 uh, percent. Oh yeah, fat accrual is why is wildly easier than muscle accrual yes you know it's just insane it's easy yeah muscle accrual is not not, not, especially for somebody who's been training for so long you know yeah yeah so um and also on the wrong side of 40 mm -hmm. you know (laughs) you're doing pretty good though but yeah it's um it gets much harder as we start to get leaner and leaner and then for i like to tell you know for men this look um getting down to let's say nine ten percent uh, for most guys is doable um, with a good routine, consistency, and diet. Getting leaner than that can be fun, but um, then it gets a little bit more obsessive and you'll, you'll, you'll start to notice some negatives, typically. Mm. It, you just you, you need to have a certain amount of body fat on your body. You'll start to see hormone changes and, and energy changes, and the leaner you get, the more that becomes uh, evident. Yeah, I sure. mean, I got to like 9% body fat, but I also concurrently cut a lot of dietary fat. that I, So I, I mm-hmm. cut not only my body fat, but the dietary fat that I've been consuming. And so my testosterone went from, it was around 11, between 11 and 1200, my, my total testosterone in January mm-hmm. at the very beginning of my cut to about 700, 700 yeah. to 800 yeah. in March. Yeah, a lot of people look at uh, professional athletes as examples and they say, well, look at so-and-so's performance and he's shredded. You're looking at um, genetic anomalies when you look at professional athletes. It's really not a good idea to compare yourself to. Um, it would be like um, me 
like reading and studying a lot and then looking at Elon Musk and be like, why am I, you know, hmm. I should be able to do what he, like these are, they're genetic freaks in the sense that their bodies are um, just so special in that particular sense with athletic performance, muscle, fat loss. If you, I mean, I, 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 I know professional athletes and some of them, the food they eat, you, you can't even believe yeah. that they eat the way they do and they look the way they do. But also just to like, to, to push back on that idea, like, yeah, from from the standpoint of athletic performance, there are genetic anomalies out there. But wouldn't you agree that most people can look wildly better than they do? Everybody. Were they to just, like, most people can, if they really put in the, the hard work. Totally. Have the six-pack. Totally. And have the pecs and have the capped shoulders. Yes. Were they to just follow these methods? Yeah, yeah. Ten, ten, nine to ten percent is doable uh, for most men. Um, you know, 18, 17, 18 percent is doable uh, for most women. Um, a, a, a nice, comfortable, fit, healthy place to stay for men, anywhere between 12 to 14 percent. And for women, it's probably in the in the low 20s, um, but very doable. I'm talking about the like five, six percent body fat that thing, because yeah. people, guys, what they'll do is they'll get down to the, the 10, 9 and they're like, OK, I want to try and get to six percent. Well, now we're moving out of healthy and now we're moving into the unhealthy, um, you know, type of behaviors and things in order to get that lean and especially. Uh, for men who are, you know, all natural and all that stuff, you start to get down to seven, six percent. Your 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 testosterone is not going to like it hmm. a, at all. It's not going to feel um, very good. Um, so, but now it's like thirty to ten percent, very doable. It's but it's a long process because you're, you're that's a pretty significant amount of body fat that you would end up dropping doing that. But within that, within that, people are like, well, what do the workouts look like? Right, the workouts. When you're viewing your workouts, don't look at your workouts um, as ways to burn calories. It's really, they all, now they do burn calories, you're moving more, but don't value them for the calorie burn because um, you're just not going to get as great a result. First off, the calorie burn is almost inconsequential. It's not a lot. Even if you worked out, you know, th four days a week consistently and you burned, you know, 500 calories each time, you know, do the math over the week. It's not a ton of calories burned. What you want is you want to exercise in a way that will get your body in a more favorable place by the way it's adapted and how it's adapted. So you want to continue to train in a way that is optimal for strength and muscle. That's what you want through this process. So your routine isn't going to look too different whether or not you're trying to you know, get a PR in your, in your squat or you're trying to get down to 10% body fat. Obviously, you'd probably be stronger uh, because of you know, food intake and all that stuff with the with the other goal, but the goal should still be the same. And the routine is going to look somewhat similar. You're still mm. going to place an emphasis on uh, these kind of gross motor movement exercises, uh, your barbell squats and your deadlifts and your overhead presses and your bench presses and your rows um, and, and those kind of movements, just because they're just so they're just so effective at producing those results. And all the other exercises also have value. But, um, you know, if you look at most people's workouts, they could get, you, you mentioned junk volume. Like most people workouts are, you know, 70% waste of time wow. stuff. And the other stuff, they could do a little more of that and they'd get far better off. Because they're training, they're training too much and without proper intensity. Without proper intensity, technique, intention. Um, and they're doing... They're doing five exercises that they could do one or two exercises that would do all that would send the same signal mm. minus the fact that I did a whole bunch of other stuff, time and you know damage and stress and all that stuff. Like, like if somebody went to the gym and did um, five good sets of barbell squats, that would be more effective than if they did you know eight machines. Mm. For their legs in terms of just overall progress, strength, development, shape, all those different things. So ex all exercises are not all created equal. And the, those big gross motor movements are, are superior in terms of uh, the type of results that they produce. One huge misconception that I myself had that I, that I have completely had to throw out the window was that when you do begin a cutting phase that you have to, that you're supposed to dramatically change your workouts. No like higher reps yeah. and things like that, which is something that I, up until eight months ago, yeah. actually believed. No, so all all strength training done appropriately within um, the appropriate rep ranges. So you're looking at 
good strength training will be between, let's say, one to maybe on the high, high end, 20 to 25 reps, okay? Um, sets, you know, can vary. Rest periods can vary. So strength and muscle building rest periods are probably between 45 seconds to like five minutes. So you see a huge range there. Um, the switching routines has nothing to do with what's going to burn more body fat or build more muscle. Switching routines literally is about changing the stimulus. It's, in, it's, it's introducing that novelty that the body needs. So when you, you should change your, your emphasis or your rest periods or your, re, your rep ranges anyway, regardless of what your goals are. So I personally, now I've experimented with all of it. It doesn't matter. Um, and, and the data shows this as well. It's not just my own experience. But I personally like to do the low rep range when I'm cutting. Now, ask me why. Well, because I just have less energy to do 20 reps on the squat when my calories are low. I'd rather do, you know, three sets of five reps. Not going to be as strong, but I'm not going to feel like I'm dying you know, mm. at the squat rack. But it doesn't matter. It's just you're changing the workout, uh, changing the rep ranges and the emphasis and the intention just to introduce that novelty that gets the body to continue progressing. So when you read studies on what's the best rep range to build muscle, um, you have to be, you have to understand uh, kind of how the studies, what the studies actually mean. What you'll find in the studies is the data will show eight to 12 reps is the mu muscle building rep range. Well, if you do a, 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 you know, a 12 week study, you take a bunch of, you know, uh, average college age males, you put them in it, you compare people who do one to three reps to eight to 12 to let's say 25 to 30 reps. The eight to 12 will build a little bit more muscle. But what they don't, what people f forget to realize is all of the rep ranges built muscle. And if the group in the eight to 12 rep range stayed in the eight to 12 rep range forever, that rep range would start to become least effective. Mm -hmm. And if you move them out of it, and you put them in a one to four rep range or a 25 to 30 or whatever, then they'd start to see that progress start to happen again. So all of them build muscle. You should go through phases of each of them. And that's how you're gonna get that kind of, that more consistent progress. Hmm, super interesting, yeah. It, um, I try to vary it up as much as I can. Low reps, high reps, but I think what, you know what? What's what was what was so interesting to me is that you the the, the mindset shift. I guess yes. like like thinking about muscle and the and the specifically your workouts as sending the stimulus yes. to your body when in a cutting phase. That 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 strength is needed. Yes. Right. That we've got to like hold on to the muscle. It's the fat that's expendable. Yes. Right. Yes. And and also when you're doing when you're different rep ranges. Um, feel different and have and, and they require a different intention when you're working out. So uh, have you ever trained in the really low rep range where you're doing like doubles and triples, like sets of two, sets of three, like a power? No, I don't often. I don't often because I think it's, for me, it's, it's very, uh, it's just taxing on the nervous system. Okay. And it's like emotionally <laughs> more draining. Okay. So it's not maxes. So people think, oh, I'm doing sets of two and three. I'm going to pick a weight that's like so heavy where I could just do two or three. The proper way to do low rep training is to pick, let's say I'm gonna do a set of uh, uh, sets of two reps, pick a weight you could do five with, hmm. and then you do a lot of sets with just two. Oh. Okay, so it's still heavy. Interesting. But you're not like, oh, like that's not your max. Otherwise you will you know, go through what you said where your CNS is just yeah, fried. totally fried. So you're doing two reps with something you could do uh, five reps with, um, this is how powerlifters train. Um, that is a very different feel from doing a set of 12 reps, okay? When I'm doing a set of 12 reps, I wanna feel the target muscle, I wanna squeeze, I wanna feel the pump, I'm trying to like feel my chest in the bench press or my shoulders in the overhead press. When you're doing low reps, you're trying to perfect the, the skill and the leverage and the technique. Hmm. So I'm not trying to feel any muscle specifically when I'm doing the bench press for two reps, I'm just trying to get tight in the perfect position, trying to stay great with my technique and controlled, and I'm trying to do my two reps. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, 
Click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. So it's a very different intention. And then doing like 20 to 25 reps, different again. Now I'm just trying to, you know, I'm trying to, I'm, it's grueling. I'm right. trying to get through the set. I'm trying to keep my breath and not hold my breath. I'm trying to be able to, to finish uh, the set. The reason why I'm explaining this is P, the, there are studies that show that they compare mixing up rep ranges throughout the week versus doing what's called block or phase style training. So like some people will say, and I'm one of them, will say you're better off doing like three or four weeks of low rep training, training and then three or four weeks of higher rep training versus, you know, Monday I'll do some high reps and, you know, Wednesday I'll do some low reps and so on. Now the data will show that the muscle and strength gains are the same regardless of how you do it. But I'll argue that unless you're like really advanced, that the block training is better because the mindset um, and the intention is so different mm. from one style to the other that I think there's value in really understanding and perfecting what it feels like to squat for three reps over the course of three weeks. Just the intention, the tightness and how you feel and going down and coming up and versus like, okay, now I'm three weeks, I'm doing 12 reps and I'm trying to feel my quads. I'm trying mm. to squeeze them at the top. Uh, type of deal. So I uh, blocked, and this is how you'll find our, our programs written. They're always written in these in these phases versus uh, mixing it up so much. Super interesting. For those that are out there trying to convince you that carbs is the reason that you've gained weight, or too much sugar inside of the diet, obviously all carbs get breaking down broken down to sugar, or fat is the reason. It's really fundamentally you have to have excess calories if yes. we're talking about ongoing weight gain. It's a lot more complicated on that, but without the excess calories, you're just not going to be adding the extra weight. That's correct. hundred percent. And you're going to erase a lot of the issues associated with, uh, with those, with the consumption of those things. Look, there's populations in the world that eat a whole food based diet that are super high in carbohydrates. Um, and they do, they're extremely healthy. And then there's other populations in the world that eat a very high fat, uh, you look at the the traditional Inuit diet, right? So it's like very high fat, uh, high protein diet, almost no carbohydrates. They're very healthy as well. They don't overeat. That's what it is across the board. So, and again, that's the challenge. Like if you if you live in this world, this modern world, um, the big challenge is how do I not overeat? Because the everything around me is designed. You know, markets are amazing but they're also could be dangerous because they give us what we want. They don't necessarily give us what we need. And what do we want? We want enjoyable food. We want food that, man, every time I take a bite, I am just excited to eat this meal. And so markets have done that. They've invested a lot of time and energy into making foods so palatable that it's, you have to white knuckle your way through uh, and, and try to eat an appropriate amount of calories. If you stick to whole foods, Try overeating. I dare you. If you eat a whole food, high protein diet, you probably won't overeat. In fact, it'll be very difficult to do so. Well, what you were hinting at before where people showcase that, hey, listen, you can eat at McDonald's every single day, every single meal, and still see improvements. Those individuals that might be running those experiments are staying within the appropriate That's calorie right. range for them. But there's this whole movement now, and maybe Tessa, we could Google this. Uh, just Google like ultra processed foods can be healthy. Yeah. I'm sure you've seen this. Yeah. So Guardian here, for those that are watching, some ultra processed foods are good for your health. Uh, WHO backed study finds. And I believe this is the yeah. one that I came across. I don't know, was this article I might've seen on CNN. Yeah. But the argument there that some of these researchers have been making is that, hey, listen, the world is so addicted to ultra processed foods. In the United States, upwards of almost 70% of our calories are coming from ultra processed foods. The rest of the world, especially Middle East, India, other countries are following in suit. Mm -hmm. So we have to teach people how to be healthy eating these ultra processed foods. In one way, you're saying that, okay, sure, if you stick to a certain calorie range, but the problem is good luck trying to do that over the course of your lifetime. Yeah, so let me be very clear, okay? Ultra processed foods are not inherently unhealthy, although a lot of them are. You can make 
a a food that is uh, somewhat healthy. You know, it's fortified with nutrients. It's got a good macro breakdown. Um, so you could look at something and go, okay, this if consumed appropriately, right, in the context of a you know a calorie count that's right for me, this will be healthy. Yes, yes, that's true. Also, ultra processed foods have a long shelf life. There's value to that. Okay. You try delivering food to corners of the world where people are hungry, try delivering them fresh fruits and vegetables and meats, and you run into some serious problems, right? By the time it gets there, 60% of the food has gone bad and it's expensive. And so I get that, right? I understand that. And there's value in that. So I'm not saying destroy processed foods, okay? What I'm trying to say is this is the argument. And what they try to do, by the way, is they try to twist the argument. And, and, and now you may be wondering, and we'll, we'll veer off for a second. Why are they making these arguments? Process the processed food market is extremely profitable. There are there's huge incentives to keep the average person eating a seventy percent processed food diet. Now, why is it so profitable? Well, if I take a potato, I can't patent the potato. Every you can grow potatoes. I can grow potatoes. We could sell them. I can't patent mine and sell it and make it special. But if I take that potato and combine it with some other ingredients and make a potato snack, well, now you can't copy me. I can patent it. I can protect it. So processed foods uh, in markets uh, can be very, very valuable and very profitable. Whole foods, maybe with the exception of genetically modified foods, which can be uh, protected by patent, which is a whole nother conversation. Um, largely, the margins are tiny you know, uh, grow beef, sell beef, grow corn, you know, a, a non-GMO corn, grow, you know, rice, potato, carrots. The margins are small because I can't protect my product. Everybody can grow them. So there's a lot of incentives to put information out there. And this is, I wouldn't call it disinformation, but it is misinformation in the sense that, yes, if your calories are within the range they're supposed to, if you're getting adequate proteins and fats and nutrients, can it be healthy compared to a diet that lacks those nutrients or a high calorie diet? Yes. Yes. Here's the problem. And I'm not talking to the person who's struggling to get food, who's like, oh my God, I'm starving. Thank you for delivering this bread or this, you know, spam or whatever. Right. I understand that. I'm talking to the average person. Most of us in modern societies don't, we don't have a starvation problem. Let's be very clear. More people are going to die from overconsumption and obesity by far than underconsumption. Starvation is not an issue, really, in modern society. So that's who I'm talking to. And what I'm saying is, if you want to be healthy, be aware. Be very aware that these foods will make you overeat. Or you're going to have to count your calories every single day and play that game. And in my experience, that's not a long-term strategy. It sucks. It's hard. It's too hyper aware and counting and tracking, and it makes food and diet become stressful. And stress does not contribute <laughs> to healthy eating habits. It does the opposite. And so you find this, you find people counting calories and counting everything that they put in their mouth. And I'm eating these processed foods from this company that tells me that if I buy their frozen foods and just eat them, I'm going to be healthy. The fail rate on them is terrible. It's they, Everybody fails. At some point, like I just want to go I don't want to be stressed out. I don't want to count every calorie that goes into my mouth. Well, what I'm saying, and the data will back me up, is you don't have to. Pay attention to your protein. That's about it. Avoid heavily processed foods for the most part. And you will naturally, unless you have some really bad relationship with food issues, which some people do have, and I respect that. I understand that. It's another challenge. But for most people, if you just did that, you're not going to get shredded. You're not going to walk around with a six-pack. But you're going to fall within a healthy body fat percentage. So for a man, you're probably going to be around 15, 16% body fat. If you do that, you'll naturally fall in that place. And for women, you're probably going to fall somewhere in the low to mid 20s with body fat percentage. You're not going to have people walking around 60, 70, 80 pounds overweight, overweight if they follow that advice. Mm. I don't know if you've seen this, but there's some clips that are floating around, different experts saying this, but People saying that the number one driver of belly fat is high cortisol. Yeah. Have you seen this? I have. Around there? I have. And I think that knowing some of the people that are out there that are saying this, of course, you've mentioned that weight gain has multiple different aspects to mm -hmm. it. Part of what I feel is that 
we're doing a little bit of disservice to individuals by making them feel that stress is the primary driver of weight gain when just hearing what you shared earlier, which is that you have to have the excess calories first. Not mm -hmm. that stress can't play a major role in it. What's your take on this whole clip? Okay. Um, the our, How hormones affect fat storage, muscle gain, behaviors, mood is very complex. Hormonal imbalances can definitely drive unhealthy behaviors. So let's start with that, right? So if you're a man and your testosterone levels, let's say, are low, you've got cortisol levels that are inappropriate. And I use the word inappropriate. I don't use the word high because you want high cortisol in the morning. You talk to any hormone specialist and a, a healthy cortisol level comes up in the morning, peaks, and then starts to drop throughout the day so you can go to sleep. Inappropriate cortisol levels are typically the opposite. They're low in the morning. I need tons of caffeine to get myself to wake up. And then, oh, oh now I'm stressed out another high and I can't sleep at night. That's a, that's a common inappropriate cortisol level. But in hormone levels that are off are, although they cause things, they cause things that happen in your body and, and they can drive behaviors. They're the result of something else. They're they're Again, it's a smoke. Okay. So what's causing my hormone levels to be all over the place? Well, poor lifestyle, bad sleeping patterns, uh, abusive stimulants or sedatives, bad diet, not exercising properly. Like not exercising will really cause hormones to, to not be in optimal ranges. Like men, we know this, like if you don't exercise, your testosterone levels will probably drop. Your androgen receptor density will probably, will definitely go down. We know when women will see these changes in estrogen and progesterone that are not so balanced. Now, when cortisol level when cortisol levels are inappropriate, there is evidence to suggest that it can change fat storage patterns. Okay, it can definitely do that. There is a lot of debate as to how big of a difference it's going to make. So, so let's say you're a female and you typically store body fat in the way that women do, which is around the lower body. Um, it's probably not going to all of a sudden make you just store body fat in your belly. And, you know, like it's not going to change everything radically. Um, that's what the data seems to suggest. But here's why I think people are hitting that, uh, that button. Because if I say cortisol is the problem, cortisol, 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 what typically follows is my solution, which is a cortisol lowering supplement. Take ashwagandha, take this, lowers cortisol. Here's my, here's my patented whatever that's going to fix the problem. The real answer to hormone imbalances is to lead a life that is healthy. And what you'll find is the hormones will follow. Now, there are cases where that doesn't happen, in which case there's something else that's underlying. But for the most part, if you live a, a lifestyle that is balanced and healthy, you're going to have hormone levels that reflect that. So I don't think it's fair to take somebody who's you know 50 pounds overweight Oh, look, you store around a lot around your belly. Let's test your hormones. Wow, your cortisol is all over the place. Here's this medication to fix your cortisol, right? Why don't we say you're not exercising? Let's start doing a little bit of activity. Let's look at your diet. Okay, it looks like you're not consuming adequate protein. It looks like you're consuming a lot of heavily processed foods. Let's work on that a little bit. Wow, let's look at your sleep. Your sleep doesn't look very good. You're not averaging about eight hours a night. You go to bed at different times uh, during the week. You wake up at different times. You're using maybe too many stimulants. You know, I can make a long list here. We don't do that. Instead, we say, oh, your hormone. Like if you're a man, I'll, I'll use a di different example. You're a man. You go to the, you go get your testosterone levels checked. Oh, look, you have low testosterone. Let's put you on testosterone replacement therapy. You'll feel better, but it's a Band-Aid. Uh, if that man is not exercising, has a poor diet and poor sleep, like if you fix those, 80% of men will see a significant improvement in their testosterone levels. So I don't, I don't like that message. Uh, I've worked with people for, for decades. I've worked with hormone doctors. Changing lifestyle often moves things in the right direction and often takes care of those problems trying to take care of those problems with band-aid solutions like hormones or supplements. Um, you'll, you'll notice some positive effects in terms of how you feel, but it's not really fixing the problem. So if, if cortisol is causing your body fat to store bo uh, your, your body to store body fat in a way that is different than a way that it used to changing your lifestyle 
not only will make you leaner anyway, but should reverse that. Yeah, I think the other part that feels a little disingenuous with it is that even the people that have nothing to sell, what feels disingenuous is that, hey, the reason that we're all as a society so fat is because we're so stressed out. Yeah. And that's what's causing the cortisol levels. Yeah. But if we put you in a all expenses paid retreat for the entire year, yeah. but just kept on feeding you excess calories and excess calories from especially ultra processed foods, you're still going to gain weight yeah. no matter even if your cortisol levels are in the ideal situation. Yeah, you know what's interesting about stress? We First of all, you need stress. So we need to stop demonizing stress. Stress uh, is a, it signals the body to adapt. Okay, so exercise is stress. If you took a blood test on me or anybody else post-workout and you didn't know I exercised, you would think, uh-oh, this is not good. We got inflammatory markers going up and... Something's wrong with this person. We need to make sure we get them to the hospital so it look good because you didn't know I exercised, okay? Sunlight is a stress. Um, uh, you know, eating, there, there are components in food that have a hormetic effect that cause you to become healthier because they're a stress. Uh, it, you need some. In fact- Sauna, cold water immersion. Um, behavior specialists will tell you this. We need challenge in life to feel some kind of meaning. Okay. People think if we were given everything we ever needed and we live these plush lifestyles that we would suddenly feel amazing. You know, look, here's, here's all the evidence you need. Okay. It's the year, you know, we're, we're in the, we're in an advanced age. Okay. More people have more stuff than they've ever had. More people have shelter and food and clothes. We have too much stuff. And yet anxiety is higher. Depression is higher. Like what is going on here? It's not the stress. It's uh, how we handle the stress. It's how we perceive the stress. It's a lack of meaning and purpose in our lives that's causing the problem. It's not the that we have necessarily too much. We might have too much stress for how we handle it, but we also need to look at how, like, for example, let's talk about physical stress, okay? If you exercise regularly and you're fit, your body can handle physical stress more than somebody who's not fit and healthy. If you took somebody who's sedentary and you took someone who's fit and you stress their body out by having them, let's say, walk 20 miles, you'll notice that the fit person, they're probably going to feel okay. The person who doesn't, it, it, might, it, was, it would be too much. Walking 20 miles would be too much. They might even get an injury as a result. This is true for emotional, spiritual stress as well. And so uh, it's far more complex is what I'm trying to say. I don't have the answers, but what I'm trying to say is it's far more complex than we just have too much stress in our life. You know, what's funny about that? Uh, my, I'm a, I'm the product of, of poor immigrants. Okay. You know, I talked to my, my grandfather passed away, but I remember when I used to talk to him about how he grew up, you know, he, nine siblings, they grew up in a room probably as big as this that they shared with the donkey that his dad owned because that's how he was able to provide for the family. Um, they were extremely poor at nine years old. He was working hard labor. He came to this country, had to figure it out. Um, and you know, if I went to him and I said, you know, Hey, no, no, um, man, I'm really stressed out. <laughs> you know what I did today? I talked on three podcasts and we talked about health and fit. I'm, oh man, I'm so stressed out. Like I would feel embarrassed to tell him that. Like what's ha what's what's the difference? You know, I think they had a tighter uh, community. I think they had values. I think they had a lot of meaning and purpose in their life. So not to shame anybody, um, it, it, you know, and obviously, yes, I still feel stressed myself. I just think it's a lot more complex than we have too much stress in our lives. I, you know, honestly, you know what helps me a lot? If I don't go on my phone all day long, I feel like I can handle so much more stress. You know, how, how interesting is that? Yeah, it almost seems like a lot of our chronic stress is coming from overstimulation. Totally. You know, I think back in the day, and your family's from Italy, yeah, is that right? Yeah, Sicily. Sicily. Yeah. Do you know the story of Rosetta? Do no. you know the story of Rosetta? No. Tessa, let's go bring this up. So Rosetta, in the 1960s, there was a group of Italian immigrants that moved together to the United States. And they ended up in this town in Pennsylvania. And they literally ended up kind of recreating like an Italian village. Mm. You have all these families that are living with multi-generations in the same, you know, home. 
probably with a little bit more space than maybe many of them had, like the one room in Sicily or whatever. And um, they're living a traditional way of life within the American context. Many of them are starting to get jobs at different factories. They're farming, other things like that. And one of the local doctors who was servicing that town and a little neighboring town, because they were very small, he was at a conference one day getting a beer at like a local bar. And he was telling a researcher that he was sitting next to, he was like, you know, it's crazy. I'm like the doctor for this town, Rosetta in Pennsylvania. There has not been one person under the age of 65 that has died from cardiovascular disease. Mm. And this was the time that now cardiovascular disease was just starting to become more known. Mm. Time Magazine, all these articles, you know, fat is causing heart disease. And the researcher was like, this is super interesting. We got to like look into this. We got to look into what's going on. So they started studying the town. And they were like, okay, is it the water that they're drinking? Is it the food? And at that point in time, they were eating still a lot of the traditional meals, but the food had already started changing mm. in getting a lot more American meals and stuff because that's all they had access to. 1960s, like even to find olive oil in America hard. is super yeah. hard. Yep. So they're eating just whatever they can get access to. And then uh, as they continued to study them and look at them, uh, the next generation that was there, the, the 70s, you started to have uh, for the first time, people under the age of 65 in that town would die yeah. from cardiovascular disease. And that study continued. And ultimately what they found is that it wasn't the food. It wasn't the water. It was essentially uh, the way that they were living. That in these towns, when they first moved here from Italy, you had multiple people in the same house yeah. that were there. You had these tight community bonds and these family relationships the average male, when they first came here in the 60s, I believe, he was part of like three kind of different social groups that were there. And as increasingly people started to become more Americanized, they stopped living in the same home. They were distant from their sort of families. They weren't as social, didn't have as much downtime, weren't spending as much time outside. And all of a sudden, this idea of sociogenomics, how we live our friendships and how tight our bonds are in our relationships played a massive role. And this goes back to this idea that, you know, you mentioned when you stay away from your phone, you feel better. I think that those generations, even though they had a tougher life, right? They had less stimulation. They weren't as overstimulated and they also had tighter bonds. They had tighter family bonds. They had more downtime and they had more support system that was there. It was such a fascinating uh, effect that they've, researchers coined the term the Rosetta effect. Yeah. The way that you live could have that much of an impact on your health and if, lifestyle. If humans are anything, we're social animals. We're so social. Um, it's if you really think about it, like it's it's amazing how social we are. It's considered cruel and inhuman uh, punishment to to take a POW and put them in isolation. That's a Geneva Convention. That that's cruel to put them in isolation. Okay. We need each other. And what we've done is we've effectively separated ourselves so significantly. This is probably one of the main reasons why we're seeing all these issues with anxiety, with stress. Um, you know, we're, we don't feel a sense of shared values or community. Um, and our phones are really a cheap substitute. They're the processed food of, of connection. You know, uh, Arthur Brooks, good friend of mine, who's an expert on this. He says that the you, you talk to somebody through social media, you get the dopamine, but you don't get the oxytocin. Mm. So it's it's not the same. It's literally not the same. You know, I'll 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 use an example that because people might think like I, I, we've been so conditioned to think that it's everything else and that that doesn't play a huge role. I'll use another example that tends to blow people away, somewhat connected. But what age do you think people have? If you, when they do surveys, at what age do people have the best um, body acceptance where they, they like their bodies? Hmm. I would probably have to guess later years. Yeah. Like 50 plus. You're, you're on it. Yeah. It's like uh, 60s. Wow. You know, people would say, well, well, I mean, should be your early 20s. That's when you're young and you look the best. No, no, no. People are most satisfied with their bodies in their 60s. Now, why is that? Because it's not has less to do with how you look, it has more to do with the wisdom that comes with I think getting older. 
I think, look, I was, uh, you know, I was, I'm a child of the nineties. Okay. I remember waiting in line at the grocery store and you just had to stand there. You ever wait in line now? Everybody's on their phone. There is no quiet time. There is no time to, this is why spiritual practices, uh, one of the reasons across the board have health benefits. I think a lot of it, not all of it, there's other things, but I think a lot of it has to do with the, you know, being present, centering yourself, being quiet. I mean, that's what prayer is, right? That's what meditation is. So yeah, putting your phone down, I think makes a big, makes a big, and the data now is starting to come out on the effects of social media and technology on kids. We didn't have this data because it just exploded onto the scene. And uh, we're seeing very negative effects. Here's the interesting thing. As I'm saying this, because I know I feel this when I hear it, people are like, oh, put my phone down. That should be a sign right there. When I tell you, put your phone down and you're like, oh, I can't, I don't know if I want to do it. It's hard. Yeah. Well, that, that's a sign right there. Try doing it. Turn it off, put it down, and then just take note of, of how you feel. It's the ultimate distraction tool. We're constantly being bombarded. You know, our phones are extensions of markets. And again, I said this earlier, markets give us what we want, not what we need. And, you know, what do our primitive brains want? We want to be scared. We want to be alarmed. We want to be shocked. You know, we want to compare to other people. Look at your algorithm on your social media. Look at all the pictures that pop up. Is that really healthy for you? If you really think about it, probably not. You know, my space, the fitness space is notorious for this. Kid, people today, I'll, I'll tell you a stat that'll blow, that tends to blow people away. Did you know that six pack abs are more rare than millionaires? Mm. It's more rare to have a six pack than it is to be a millionaire. Now you go on social media, you wouldn't think that at all. You think everybody has a six pack. Look, I worked in gyms my entire life. That's a self-selection bias of fit people. Six packs are rare. Okay. They're very, very rare, but you wouldn't think so. You would go on social media and think, oh my God, everybody's beautiful. Everybody looks perfect. And now with AI, it's going to get much worse. Like turn it off or change your algorithm. Watch what happens to your mental health and your stress and your anxiety. So again, this is, uh, my, my expertise is in fitness and health. I've only, I'd say over the last five years, really dive deep into this because health, as I've learned, as I've done this longer and longer, isn't just exercise and diet. It's a, it's a lot of things. And I've had people on my show that are experts in this. And, uh, it's, it is a hundred percent true. You know, now in my forties, I'm practicing this. And I'm like, man, I wish I knew this when I was younger, it's having profound effects on myself, which mm. I knew this, you know, years ago. In your experience with, with helping so many people do this, what have been some of the, the keys to the people who have had success sticking to a program long-term? Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that. So number one, you kind of uh, mentioned this a little bit. You should feel better after your workout than you did uh, going into your workout. Okay. So in other words, you shouldn't leave and feel like you're dying or, you need to crawl back to the car. You should feel good. Now, there's two reasons for that. One, because if you feel good at the end, you probably trained appropriately for your body, which is gonna give you better results anyway. But number two, if you're gonna do this for the rest of your life consistently, at some point, you're gonna dread working out and feeling like you're dying at the end of your workout, okay? At some point, you're gonna hate doing that. Now, some people love that. I call those people fitness fanatics, right? So we're talking again to the average person. And there's a place for that, even with fitness fanatics. They can't do that all the time either. So, so that's number one. You should feel better at the end of your workout than you did at the beginning. So that'll help. Here's number two. Don't focus on the goal. I know that sounds crazy because everybody sets goals. But what you want to do is you want to learn, and this is a learned process. You want to learn how to enjoy the process, okay? So uh, there's a, a saying that I say all the time when I get on, on podcasts, and it's this. The man who enjoys walking is going to walk further than the man who enjoys getting to a destination, okay? The man who enjoys walking, he's going to reach all the destinations because it's a side effect of the fact that he likes to walk. He's always going to walk, right? The man who likes the destination, well, once I get there, I'm done. What do I do now, right? So learn to love and enjoy the process. How do I do that? Well, I said one thing, make sure you feel better at the end. Here's another one. When you're going to work out, remember what you're doing. You're taking care of yourself because you deserve to be taken care of. What you don't want to do is go to the gym and think, I'm going to, you know what? I'm fat. 
or I need to burn that burrito off, or, oh, I'm so disgusted with myself. I can't believe I gained five pounds, whatever. Because what will happen is that workout will become a punishment. Whether you like it or not, whether you realize it or not, that workout is now a punishment. And nobody wants to punish themselves all the time, right? But if you frame it as I'm taking, which is true, I'm taking care of myself. Also, when you go to the gym, think to yourself, how can I take care of myself today? You'll train yourself more appropriately more often if you do that. Hey, sorry to interrupt. We have a free guide titled Understanding Your Mood, Stress, and Sleep. It tackles all of those things from a health and longevity perspective. It's a totally, totally free guide. So just click on the link at the top of the description below. Because you're more likely to pull back if you're too tired or stressed. Maybe go a little harder if you have more energy, right? So learn to enjoy the process. Learn to enjoy the process. And then third, do the most effective, efficient things that you could possibly do, right? If I could get the same results working out two days a week with a very effective routine that I would get working out six days a week with an ineffective routine, well, pick the one that's more effective. Requires less energy and less time, okay? And then here's the final kind of point about this. And I'm making it sound like, oh, we just do these things that'll work for you. No, it's, it's still gonna be challenging because we have to stop focusing so much on motivation and start realizing that what we need to focus on is learning the skill of discipline, okay? Motivation is a great feeling. It's amazing. When I feel motivated, I do everything, right? I never had to convince a client to eat right when they were motivated. I never had to convince a client to work out when they were motivated. So now why am I saying this? Because we, so, we focus so much on motivation. Oh, I got to get hyped. Got to get motivated. How can I get motivated? It's, look, it's, it's a state of mind that comes and goes. So when you have it, you have it. That's great. What we need to do is figure out how can we stay consistent when the motivation has gone? Because it will be gone at some point. It'll come back, but it'll be gone too at some point. Well, that's where discipline comes into play. And discipline can be developed. It's a skill. And you'll find that some of the most disciplined people in the world, they developed that skill over years and years of practice. They didn't just wake up disciplined, okay? Took them years. The fact that, you know, oftentimes, you know, you'll, you'll meet people who, you know, have friends that out of high school went to the military, came back, and were so much different because they, they learned the skill of discipline, right, in the military through the routines and, and whatnot. So how do you develop the skill of discipline? Here's what you do. Change something that's gonna benefit your health or your fitness, but make sure it's something that you can maintain for the rest of your life. So you have to be honest with yourself when you ask yourself this question. What can I change now that is gonna be positive that I can maintain forever? But it also needs to be a little challenging, otherwise it doesn't have any meaning. So don't make a change that means nothing to you. Do one that, okay, I gotta kind of focus on this, but realistically ask yourself, will I be able to do this for the, for, for the rest of my life? And it may look like, I'm gonna drink two extra glasses of water a day, or I'm gonna do a 10 minute walk three days a week, or whatever, it depends on the person, right? You know what it is for you, right? Pick that. Once you do that consistently, and it becomes a part of your behaviors and your habits, then you do it again. And you say, okay, what else can I do that I think I can do now that's challenging, yet realistic for me forever, that I think I can do for the rest of my life? You have to ask yourself that because otherwise people will say, you know, I'm not working out now, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna start working out five days a week. Like, okay, you're going from zero to five. Is that realistic for, you know, to, to maintain for the rest of your life? Probably not, right? Start with something smaller. And as you do this, what you'll find is each time you level up, it's a bigger step. And each time you become more proficient with the skill of discipline. And if you do this over time, then you'll find yourself developing behaviors and, and, and habits that will stick with you even when motivation is gone. Like I don't miss workouts. At this point, I don't miss workouts because it's just, I'm, it's consistent. I have that discipline. I enjoy the process. I've worked out through, uh, you know, and I've, I've done this with clients too, where they've worked out through times when they were feeling really good and strong and they're hitting PRs or when they were stressed or going through a challenging time in their life. The workouts change, right? The intensity changes, what you do changes but the consistency stays because you develop that skill of discipline. So we need to focus on that and that because the fitness industry, especially the popular fitness industry, likes to focus on motivation, hype, inspiration, motivation. That's yeah. It sells products. It sells pills and diet books, but it fails. It, it fails long-term. I mean, I think the, the fail rate for people is something like 85% 
of people, you know, either stop working out or gain the weight back within a year, right? Um, and if you stretch it out to five years, I bet it would be closer to 90%. So discipline is where it's at. And I love how you brought up like, like anchoring your results in something that you can, can control. Like, actually, for example, like how you feel after a workout, like most of the time, you can control how you feel after that workout based on the types of exercises you're going to do based on, like you said, like showing yourself a little bit of self-love about how you're, how you're treating yourself well by going to the gym and, and that sort of thing. And the other thing I, I like how you brought up too, is that like not every day you're going to be hitting PRs, not every day you're going to feel your best. And I see this with clients all the time where they're like, man, I just don't, I don't feel like myself today. I don't feel strong. And it's like, okay, it's okay. Like I don't feel like strong every day in the gym either, but I think, you know, just because you don't feel 100% doesn't mean you can't give it 100% for that day and just give it all that you have for that day. Because I think people get caught up in this all or nothing approach, at least in my experience with clients, is that sometimes if they're not feeling like their absolute best, they're like, oh, I'm just not feeling good. I'm just going to skip or I'm too stressed out. And I'm like, no, when you're stressed, when you're super busy, like you need to do your best to keep that habit in, even if it's like 10 minutes, like you don't have to come in for an hour, just keep the routine keep the discipline, and then that'll help reinforce things moving forward. Well, think of it this way. Think of exercise, especially exercise, as a tool. And this tool can be any tool that you need to improve the quality of your life now, okay? So I'm tired, I'm stressed, uh, I lost my job, I don't know, something happened. Well, now I'm gonna go to the gym and I'm gonna do things that will help me with my stress. I may do some yoga. I may do some light resistance training, just full range of motion, just to feel better, just to alleviate some of the stress, make myself feel better, right? Well, what if I go to the gym and I feel energized and strong? Well, now I change the tool. I train harder. I can train heavier, higher level of intensity, right? What if you go to the gym and your back is stiff? Well, now you change the tool again. What exercises can I do to improve the mobility and stability of my back to alleviate pain, maybe to solve some of the root issues that are causing some of that pain? See, so exercise is not a static thing. It is a tool with an infinite array of shapes and applications. I mean, you know, years ago, I went through a very challenging time in my life. I, I, I lost someone very close to me, a long battle with cancer. So it was like, a, it was almost two years. And in that two-year period, my workouts personally were just to keep me healthy and keep me, keep me centered so I could help this person and help my family. Okay? So I wasn't breaking PRs and I wasn't going after it. I was taking care of myself. I just changed the tool, the exercise tool to help me. Right. So, so that's, that's the way you need to think about it. And so that's what you ask yourself. Like, what do I need today? to improve my, the quality of my life right now? How do I leave feeling better than I did when I walked in? I think that's amazing advice. And I think like you just said personally, like sometimes like you have to just do the best with what you have. And if you're going through a hard time, you just need to, to change your, your goals up a little bit, change your workouts and just use it as a means to enhance the, the mental health benefits that you need at that time and to make sure you're staying healthy and that sort of thing. I wanna get into to something that I think I would say most struggle with when they're looking to achieve a fitness goal. I mean, we talked about adhering to a workout plan, but I think when people are trying to make changes in their eating, that becomes a whole lot harder because because the food's everywhere, right? Just like you said, and it's included in different different situations that we're involved in. So through the years, and I know you've worked with a ton of clients and you've coached even people just through the, the programs that you guys have and even answering questions on the podcast, like what have been, you know, through and through some of the biggest tips that you think have helped people like slowly change their eating habits for the long term? Yeah. Well, first we need to, we need to respect diet. Okay. Cause we don't respect diet. We think, oh, I'll just change my diet and then I'll lose weight and get healthy. And we, we completely disregard that our diet is much more than just food. Food, the, does, the, there's a lot of things connected to food. There's celebrations, there's context, you know. I'm at a birthday party, so I have birthday cake, or I'm out with my friends, so we enjoy some wine, or I'm at a, a movie, 
So I eat popcorn, there's breakfast foods and lunch foods and dinner foods. We, not, most of the time we don't even eat because we're hungry. We eat because we're stressed or anxious or bored, right? Or we just desire the palatability of the food or whatever. So we need to respect food that to the point where it is a part of our Per, our lives, our personal lives and our culture. It's kind of, what it, it's part of what makes, makes us up, okay? Now, why am I saying that? Because once you understand that, only then can we move forward in a way that's gonna be effective, okay? Otherwise, what we'll end up doing is what people tend to do, which is, oh, I'm gonna cut carbs. Oh, I'm gonna eat paleo. Oh, I'm gonna, and it's gonna work. And it never does, right? So respect it for what it is. All right, step two. I talked about the skill of discipline, right? You do that with nutrition as well. So you make a change that is challenging yet realistic forever, and you continue down that path. But there's more to it. I'll give you a couple, I'll talk about two points that I think are important. One is you have to learn to fully understand the all of the values that food provides. Now I know if people, if I ask people, what values do food provide? You say, oh, it gives me nutrients, calories, this and that, okay. But really, the values that we really understand are, are narrow. We pretty much eat food based on its palatability, okay? So when you're, out with your, when you're going out with your friends and you want to eat lunch, and they say, hey, what do you want to eat? You tend to pick the food that you feel will be the most enjoyable to eat, right? Ah, uh, you want Mexican food? Nah, I feel like, how about Chinese food? Uh, what about pizza? Okay, let's do pizza, right? So, and we were raised this way because we grew up in, in modern wealthy Western societies where with my phone, I could have pretty much any type of food I want delivered to my house within 30 minutes. So, so it's kind of a result of that, right? So what we need to do is back up a little bit and look at all of the values of food. Okay. So what are all the values? Well, there's the, the physiological values, how it affects my physical body. That's one. The enjoyment factor, by the way, all these values are important. You can't just throw one away. They're all important. The palatability, how I enjoy it. That's another one. Connecting with people. That's important, right? Do we connect with people over food? Absolutely. It's the most common way that we, that's the most common activity we do uh, with other people. Tradition might be another one. There may be um, a personal tie to food that you may have, like your mom's chicken soup, you know, that she made you when you were a kid or your aunt's, you know, you know, apple pie that you have every Christmas or whatever. So understand all those things and then start the process of becoming aware. So what you do, and this is how you start in the beginning, is it, let's take a step back for a, se for, for a second. There's four stages of learning whenever you're learning something new. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to learn how to develop a balanced, healthy relationship with food but we have to move through the four phases. The first phase is unconscious incompetence. So we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. Once you start to look at this and pay attention, then you move to the next phase, which is conscious incompetence. Now I know what I don't know. Now I know that I don't know how many calories certain foods have. Now I know that I don't know how many grams of proteins, fats, and carbs or how that affects my health, or uh, how do I get, you know, develop a better relationship with food? I'm realizing now that I don't know, right? Then you move to the third phase, which is conscious competence. This is where you have to consciously pay attention to what you're eating and consciously make changes, but you don't wanna stay there because conscious competence with nutrition is not a natural, comfortable way of living. I mean, that's like counting your macros or your calories all the time, entering your food into your food app all the time. It's okay to, to, to go there, but don't end up there. You don't want to stay there. Either you'll jump off or you'll develop a neurotic uh, relationship with food that's not great either, you know, like uh, kind of along the lines of orthorexia, right, where everything has to be perfect. You see this in the, um, in the fitness space actually quite a bit. I felt that for a while. I was traveling on planes with frozen chicken and broccoli, and it wasn't good. No, no, it's not healthy, right? No. It's not mentally healthy. No, right? no. And then the last phase is unconscious competence. You naturally have this balanced relationship with food, okay? So here's how we get there. We start by becoming more aware. First off, when you eat, don't be on your phone, don't watch TV, 
Don't read a book. Try to be as present as possible. Now, number one, you'll probably end up eating less as a result of this. Studies will show that people eat uh, something like 15% less calories when they're not distracted. But number two, it helps you pay attention, okay? Chew your food, taste it. What am I experiencing? How do I feel afterwards? How do I feel afterwards? How's my digestion feel? How's my energy? Just start to pay attention to these types of things. And what'll happen is you'll start to make new connections to food. So to give an example, I had a client once who every morning for breakfast, she ate a bagel with cream cheese. That's what she had for breakfast every morning. And she did it for, I don't know, by the time she hired me, it was like, I think she did it for 10 years. So I was like, she did it every morning. When we started this process, she started to piece together that the bagel made her bloated. Now she never really understood, she never really connected it before. She just thought, you know, I tend to get bloated. But because she started to pay attention, become more aware, she's like, I think the bagel is making me bloated. Now, you know what naturally happens? Because she made that connection, she started to desire the bagel less. I didn't have to tell her to not eat it. Because she realized this is causing this issue in me, she started to not want it, okay? Now, let's talk about that power. The difference between saying, I can't have that, and saying, I don't want that, right? Imagine if the average person just didn't want to eat unhealthy. Not that they couldn't, not that they said to themselves, I can't do that. They just don't want it, right? What an amazing place to be, okay? So she made a negative connection, but you can also make positive connections. So I had another client who, she had a very bad diet, one of the worst diets I'd ever seen in my entire life. I love this woman, but it was horrendous. So we took all these little small steps, okay? I mean, she didn't drink water, she drank Diet Coke. That, that was her, just to give an example. She had no water <laughs> during the day. So she made a positive connection through this process. We took these small steps, like I explained, and this was maybe, I don't know, four months into the process. Hated vegetables, did not want to eat vegetables ever. And I said, you know, let's try introducing them in small doses, and let's try to remain, maintain awareness around the vegetables. So what did she notice at first? I don't like the taste. It doesn't taste as good as my Hot Pockets that I have. Okay, that's good. Let's keep trying this and see what happens. Small doses. Then she started to notice my digestion's a little better when I eat some vegetables. And then she started to notice, I feel more energy. I just generally feel better when I have that small serving of, of steamed broccoli that, you know, you, you, that we've been working with. And you know what started to happen? She started to want more broccoli because she made a positive connection. Now, this is not groundbreaking science. Food manufacturers have known this for decades. They make connections all the time for you in their marketing because they know it's effective. Like, for example, what place do you crave popcorn more than the movies? Like, I never think of popcorn. When I'm at the movies, I want popcorn, right? That association has been made. So it works. It really does work. And what will happen is you'll start to develop a more balanced relationship with food. Now, that doesn't mean you'll all of a sudden stop thinking pizza is delicious. No. But you may start to realize that that delicious pizza does these other things. And so I kind of don't want it as much as I used to, right? It doesn't mean that certain foods are gonna be all of a sudden incredible tasting, right? But it may mean that you'll start to appreciate and desire certain foods because of these other benefits that you're, you're starting to, to connect. And so over time, you develop kind of this balanced relationship to where you're out somewhere and someone says, hey, you want a glass of wine? You say, nah, I don't want it, I'm cool. Or you may say, you know what? Right now I'm gonna connect with my friends, so I think I'll have a glass of wine, right? So you develop, again, a more balanced relationship. And that's really the only long-term approach that'll work. There is really no other way. Otherwise, it's the restrict model, the on the wagon, off the, off the wagon model, and it's just, it's gonna be a constant, you know, extreme back and forth battle that people tend to go through. Right, and I think so, so many times people try to put the cart before the horse and saying, okay, like, let's just look at calories, let's go on this diet, let's do this cleanse, let's use this app. 
but the people don't have the, the, the fundamentals in place. They don't have the habits. They don't have the ability to connect with themselves and develop some sort of understanding of what they're eating and how it's making them feel or, you know, why they're eating, cer eating certain foods or the benefits and of eating a certain way or how a certain food is actually impacting their health negatively. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. One other thing I want to get into when it comes to nutrition before we close is, is this, is that a lot of people I think that I've trained through the years, one of the struggles that they've had, like, let's just say that they are eating healthier now and, and they're, they're doing better. They're eating a solid breakfast. They're getting a good lunch, they're eating a good dinner. They're having good snacks throughout the day or however they choose to consume those calories. How do they know if they're, if they're getting enough food? Like what's a good, I mean, cause I know that, you know, we don't want to be neurotic about constantly counting calories, but I do think that to some level, obviously calories are an important thing to pay attention to. So how, like, what's a good gauge for the average person that you've helped your client or helped your clients use so that, that way they, they know when they need to eat more or eat less depending on their goals. Well, if you want to lose weight, you eat less, right? If you want to gain weight, you eat more. So besides the goals side, let's just say you're trying to have a balanced, healthy life and you want to, you know, am I eating too little? Am I eating too much? Your weight on the scale, your body composition will give you some clues. Energy is another one, right? So if your energy is really low and you, you just kind of feel you're, not, you're losing strength, you're losing performance, you may need to eat more food. If you start to notice signs of nutrient deficiencies, like dry skin, brittle nails, hot, cold flashes, low libido, digestive issues, then we need to look and see, are you getting an adequate amount of fats and proteins? Because those are the essential macronutrients, right? Am I getting an adequate amount? Now, for the most part, we typically don't, as trainers, work with people who tend to undereat, right? It's usually the overeat crowd. But the undereat crowd, it's small, but it can still be challenging because people, you know, they don't realize they're undereating. But it's the, the energy, I would say, is the biggest one, right? Your poor energy and your poor performance when you exercise or do anything strenuous, that could be an indicator that you might not be eating enough. What about things that you do yourself or with clients that are now the bonus on top of the foundation, right? You've already covered yeah. some of the foundational things in this episode. We did a lot on the previous episode as well. You know, not eating excess calories, especially from ultra processed foods. It's going to be hard to peel back from how addictive that lifestyle is, and it's just going to cause us to eat more. Focusing on whole foods, prioritizing protein for the satiety, as well as for the muscle building component, and then your recommendations for resistance training at some cadence, depending on where you're starting mm -hmm. in, in, in how this is following. Are there things now, for those that are listening, because we have people of all different sort of cohorts yeah. that are following along, that are like, hey, look, I'm looking for now the optimization category. Are there classifications that you now uh, either have an approach or a recommendation on the rabbit hole that people can go under? So let's start with the first one. Let's talk about like therapeutics, mm. right? Are you a fan of peptides or any additional components that people could be looking at now? Again, when they have a foundation of these basic things with diet, lifestyle, rest and sleep, which is an important part of it too. And, and recovery. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, peptides are, I, I just started really working with and learning about peptides over the last year. Um, and they're remarkable at what they can do for the body. We had an expert on our show, Dr. Seeds, who's one of the leading researchers and doctors that work with peptides. Um, and he really illuminated uh, to me on what some of their effects and benefits are. So now there's a lot of peptides that are out there. Um, but some of them have some pretty remarkable pro health effects and they're different than drugs. This was a big one for me when I asked him this is hey, what's the difference between a peptide and a pharmaceutical? So, well, peptides already exist in the body. So what we're doing is we're, we're using something the body's familiar with already has control mechanisms and barriers so that it doesn't overdo things. It doesn't downregulate receptors or cause other side effects. We know what the peptide they're already in your body. So when we give you this peptide, um, it's a signal your body's used to. And that's why we don't see lots of these negative effects like we would with pharmaceuticals. So I thought that was interesting. The, the follow-up question was, well, why aren't it wasn't every pharmaceutical company selling peptides? Well, the answer to that is there 
compound pharmacies can create them. You can't patent them. So you see right now these uh, GLP-1 agonists like um, semaglutide or what's the Ozempic is the brand name, right? That's making lots of waves right now. Ogovi. Yeah, right. Um, You could buy semaglutide from a compounding pharmacy and you're not getting Ozempic, the brand name, but it's the same thing. In fact, they're they're lobbying the FDA, of course, to to stop this because I think they want to protect their profits. But it is an interesting space. But you're right. Uh, uh, in comparison to other lifestyle changes, they're, they pale in comparison. But peptides can be pretty interesting, especially as you get older. And if you've done all the other stuff and you want to kind of like take it to the next level. I've now experienced uh, certain peptides and some of them are pretty remarkable. Uh, BPC-157, um, thymus and beta-4. Um, I'm noticing some very interesting effects from those in terms of inflammation and recovery. Um, so, you know, but I, those aren't things that I would, you know, recommend to clients before having them work on their, their diet or exercise. Um, here's something that's, you know, it's common. If I, you know, once I say this compound, you'll know it cause everybody knows it, but it's quite clear that this is a pro longevity, pro health, pro wellness supplement, which is creatine. Creatine has you know, that was originally sold for people who want to build muscle or improve their strength and performance. Creatine is healthy. It's healthy across the board. It's good for everybody. It uh, It's very good for mitochondrial health. It's very good for the heart. It's good for the brain. Um, most people should be taking creatine because it's got health benefits uh, across the board. And in fact, the wellness space is starting to now promote it. But I, I think in the next 10 years, it's going to be we're going to give it to everybody because it seems to have health benefits across the board. It's also the most studied supplement. There's literally thousands of studies on creatine. It's very safe uh, compound as well. So that's that's something that I like to. Do you know enough about. about creatine to kind of explain to the audience kind of how it works and why it's beneficial? Yeah. So creatine in, in increases or helps fuel the amount of ATP that your body uses, which is a fundamental you know muscle energy, or, or should I say, fundamental form of energy for all mitochondria. So more ATP means the mitochondria um, operates uh, more effectively and efficiently. We just talked about mitochondria earlier, about its role, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction in cancer. They see mitochondrial dysfunction in all, in almost all chronic kind of health issues. So it's keeping the mitochondria healthy. It also um, reduces the amount of methyl donors you need for all, lots of complicated processes in the body. So you'll hear that sometimes like, oh, you need more methyl donors. You should supplement with methyl B vitamins or if you have this particular gene variant or whatever. Creatine is very effective at that. But if you look at the data, look at the data on creatine and cognitive function, depression, heart function, liver function, you know, uh, you know, um, just uh, just the, the entire body it seems to have this pot, bone, bone health, of course, muscle health across the board. And again, it's got a lot of studies. I mean, you could it's literally... I think thousands, if I'm not if I'm not uh, mistaken, of studies have been done on creatine. So, it's good stuff. Any other supplements that you are a fan of in terms of um, now kind of moving from foundational to bonus and optimization? Yeah. Of course, you can go, and we've done so many episodes about the benefits of all sorts of different, there's an endless list of supplements that are there, uh, omegas and this and that, but specifically in the context of um, building lean muscle mass, dialing in body composition. Yeah. Um, nothing is going to beat filling a nutrient deficiency. Okay. So if you get a nutrient test and you're not in optimal range for vitamin D, which is quite common, uh, a lot of people are deficient in vitamin D or magnesium. It's another common one with zinc. Uh, that's a common one. And you supplement or B, B vitamins, especially if you're a vegan, and you fill that nutrient gap, it'll have profound effects on your health. Not because those nutrients are magic, but rather you are operating below, um, you know, how your body's supposed to operate because you were deficient in this thing. So like vitamin D deficiency, depression, anxiety, low testosterone, skin, bone, hair issues. Um, so you all of a sudden fill that nutrient gap and it's like, oh my God, I feel so much better. So nothing's going to beat that. The second thing would be creatine. The third thing, just because of its utility as a protein uh, supplement because you know what I said earlier for if, if you try this look if you listen to what I said and you're like okay I'm gonna hit my target body weight in protein you're gonna find pretty quickly it's hard it's not easy uh, it produces a lot of satiety um, 
you know, really, really, you know, whole foods that contain protein, um, just, just fill you up. It's, it's tough to hit those numbers. So a protein powder can be beneficial and I like to use it to fill the gap. So you hit the end of the day, you look at your protein intake, I'm 30 grams off, take a 30 gram protein shake. And that'll, that'll give you some, some pretty profound benefits. I don't think you should depend on a protein shake though. I think it's, like I said, use it as a, uh Oh, I didn't hit my targets. Now I'm going to take the shake to, to fill those needs. And that's pretty much it. Other supplements, you know, in special populations will have benefits. You know, ashwagandha seems to have some benefits for stress management as an adaptogen, but there's some cases where it might not be a good idea. Rhodiola, you know, is another one that might have some benefits. Um, but uh, they're, you know, we're, we're talking about like 1% effect when you're, when you're comparing it to, you know, diet, exercise, sleep, and lifestyle. Any modalities that you're a big fan of when it comes to recovery besides of course, making sure that people are eating appropriate amount of protein, I yeah. often find. And that was one of the things that I noticed. I used to always feel that, oh, when I go to the gym and I like lift hard, I feel like a really sore. Yeah. And then I work with a great training group out here. I think I mentioned to you last time uh, for almost a year. It's called Ultimate Performance. Mm. They're out of uh, the UK. And uh, just by consistently making sure that I hit my protein goals every day, I was immediately less sore, even though I was Oh, yeah. much older than when I was, you know, first sort of dabbling a little bit here and there in doing some tiny bit of strength training, even though I was never, you know, consistent about it. So yeah. anything that you're a big fan of on the recovery side? Uh, well, nothing's going to be good sleep. Now, a lot of people, when I say that, like, oh, I get good sleep. Here's something that everybody, most people do that they don't realize um, is compromising their sleep quality and actually having a pretty big effect on their recovery and also their health. Okay, so I'll paint the picture. Everybody does this, right? They go to bed at the same time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday comes along. Well, I don't have to wake up early on Saturday. So I'm going to go to bed two or three hours later. Saturday comes along. Well, I don't need to work Sunday. I got to wake up late. I'm going to sleep in. So I'm going to go to bed two or three hours later than I normally do. Monday comes along. Guess what happens? Jet lag. You literally give yourself jet lag every single week. Look at the studies on the, the detrimental effects of jet lag. And we give ourselves, we literally change our circadian rhythm once a week, every single week. This is why people hate Mondays. Waking up Mondays like, oh, it's so painful. <laughs> it's because you gave yourself jet lag. You can't make up for that by sleeping in, by the way. There's a little bit of benefit to it, but you can't. Talk to any sleep expert. So just do this. Go to bed and wake up the same time every single day. That will have profound benefits for for recovery, profound. So sleep is up at the top. And there's other things you can do for sleep that I'm sure you've had people on your show talk about. But that one right there, I tell people that and it blows their minds. So like, oh my God, I do that every weekend. I would love to bring up, uh, Tess, I just texted you um, um, an article that I came across recently in uh, psychiatrist.com. If you could bring it up. This is- uh, Yep, there it is. Did you see this? No. Okay, no. so title of this paper, uh, this title of the article, and then we'll click into the paper in a second why sleep consistency may be more important than duration. So if you scroll down, it says new paper. Let's go ahead and click on that. According to a new paper. So this was the mind blowing part that was there. So the title of the paper is sleep regularity is a stronger predictor of mortality risk than sleep duration, a prospective cohort study. So this was done in the UK by a group of individuals that I believe are affiliated with Oxford. And in this subset, they took almost 67,000 people that they had attached watch accelerometers to as part of this study. And they looked at one week of data about sleep consistency. And they found that people who had the best sleep consistency and sleep regularity, which was defined as going to sleep around the same time within, an, within like an hour mm -hmm. every night, and then waking up around the same time. And they had a sleep midpoint, which honestly, I didn't fully understand how they calculated that or what the benefit was, but essentially was going to sleep regularly and waking up at the same time, those individuals had an all-cause all mortality risk uh, decrease. We'll put it on our YouTube page and we'll link to it at the bottom because we're writing an article mm -hmm. on it. But it was something crazy. You had like a 68% decrease in all-cause mortality. <laughs> you had a decrease in cancer. You had a, and this was predictive. So even though it was only one week of looking at this data from this accelerometer, yeah. quite a decent sized group of people, 67,000 people, it was predictive of who later ended up developing and dying early yeah. and who developed cancer and these other things. So 
Not to say that sleep duration isn't important, and that's what the researchers are saying, it's just that sleep consistency, going back to circadian rhythms and all these other aspects, is so crucial if we want to get all the benefits of sleep. Yeah, it's uh, it's in, when I bring this up, people always trip out over it. But look at the data on swing shift workers. Have you seen that? I mean, the cancer risk, the heart disease risk, I mean, all chronic disease risk with when, with controls goes through the roof with people who don't go to bed when the sun goes down and don't wake up when the sun goes up. We evolved this way. There, okay, humans did not evolve unless there was an emergency or famine or something crazy. When it got dark, we're not very good at seeing in the dark. Okay, we're actually food. When you go out, if you go out in nature or in the wilderness and it's, it's the sun is down, you are food. So we went into our caves or went to our and we went to sleep. We that's what we did. And we woke up when the sun went up. What we do in modern societies, because we can artificially create light and whatever, and we distract ourselves and have entertainment, it's just, we literally throw our circadian rhythms off every single week. So think about this. If you're listening right now, think about how terrible it feels Monday morning when you got to wake up at 6 a.m. after sleeping in Saturday and Sunday because you went to bed so late. It feels terrible. It probably takes you until Tuesday or Wednesday to adjust. And then you repeat the cycle again. So literally, it's just, it's just such a simple hack. Go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, no matter what. Now, of course, there's going to be exceptions and stuff like that. But if you do this for the most part, you'll notice a profound impact on your recovery, on your strength, on your performance, just by doing that simple thing right there. You're literally jet lagging yourself every week. What's your take on alcohol consumption? Yeah. You know, when it comes to substances like alcohol, there's a trade-off. And the trade-off is this, because you can also get too fanatical with the, is it good for me? Is this perfect? Right? There's also life quality, quality of life. So if I'm meeting up with you and we're good friends, we haven't seen each other for a while. We're both health conscious people. We sit down, we're like, let's have, let's have some wine and hang out. There's some health benefits to that wine. Now, it's not physiological benefits. Now, I know some people make arguments about the resveratrol or antioxidant, whatever. A glass of, of, of grape juice will do the same thing, I guess. It's, it, that's, there's, the, physiologically, there's really no benefits. Alcohol's not really good for you, okay? But you and I bonding, connecting, catching up, having a great time, that's got benefits, right? So there's a bit of a trade-off, I think. And I think that's true for lots of things that we do that we wouldn't necessarily put in the category of, you know, healthy, right? Like going on vacation, not working out, indulging in, you know, the, the, the foods of the culture that were around and, you know, drinking some alcohol with my wife and having a great time. Like, yeah, I'm not working out. I'm not eating perfect, but is that good for me? Of course it is. Of course it is. So there's a life quality aspect as well. Um, there's a term called orthorexia, which describes the extreme case of of being unhealthy because you're too healthy. Follow orthorexics. These are people who stress out over every morsel that they put in their mouth. Everything that they do has to be perfect and structured and aligned because it has to be perfectly healthy. And they don't, they're not very healthy if you look at them. They have high rates of anxiety and depression and medication and their mortality isn't super great as well. Um, you know, there was a study that was, that I, you know, I often quote that showed that having poor relationships was as bad for your health as smoking 10 cigarettes a day. I think it was. So there's a balance there. So, you know, if you're drinking at home by yourself, you know, to numb yourself, probably not a good idea, but if you have the occasional glass of wine or bottle of wine with your friends, because you're bonding and having a great time, it's probably okay. Yeah. There's this whole movement now of like people kind of seeking out natural wines I don't know if you've, you know, when you've gone back to Italy yeah. to visit or Sicily, which by the way, Sicily is one of my favorite places. Oh, good. You've been there. I've been to uh, a few spots. Um, uh, or Ortigia, Ortigia. Okay. No, I've um, never been there. Been to Taramina? Uh, Taramina. Yeah, yep. beautiful. Yeah. I was there just uh, for a wedding uh, uh, earlier this year. Gorgeous. Um, beautiful place. If you've ever gone to like Europe or Italy and you've had like traditional sort of like table wines, yeah. right? There's a few things you notice. Number one, they have like less alcohol. That's the first thing. A lot of the wines we've had here, especially the ones that have become more globalized, and you look at the wine industry, it's been sort of manufactured to be higher alcohol wines, mm -hmm. you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, 19% sometimes wines yeah. that people are picking up in terms of alcohol percentage because they've had to keep up with all the other 
hard liquors and other things and make inroads into the market. The other thing is that I learned from uh, my friends, no affiliation with them, but uh, they started a company called Dry Farm Wines. Have okay. you seen these guys? I haven't. They're up in the Bay Area and they test uh, wines to make sure that they're like mold free because mold is a big issue mm-hmm. in barrels. But in the US alone, there's like hundreds of additives that you can put in yeah. to wine without disclosing it on the label. Like you can make it taste sweeter. You can put in added sulfates. You can do this, you can do that. You can. It's like almost as processed as ultra processed yeah. foods. So this whole natural wine movement, I think is really good for people going back to probably, if wines are a healthier part and people can enjoy them in a way, it's probably gonna be more how like yes. we consume them in the past with people and environment and, and and not at home by yourself. Yeah, now you're talking. See, I think, look, I, I've talked, I just did a whole spiel about hyper palatable foods and palatability and whatever. But there's a big difference between, you know, me visiting my aunt who I haven't seen in a while, who makes this incredible dish, a Sicilian dish called pasta, pasta al forno. Okay. Now it's not healthy. Okay. But when I go there and she prepares it, she takes her time to cook it. And maybe I go there early and I help her out. And then we sit down and enjoy the meal together. That's very different than me gra- grabbing a box of cookies or Doritos or Cheez-Its. Okay. Even if the macros are controlled, there's a value there that's a little bit different. So I think when you look at your food and you, uh, you respect it and it's like, I'm not drinking this to get drunk. I'm drinking this to enjoy it and enjoy our company. Very different. I'm not eating this to just numb myself. And, you know, um, one of the behaviors that you'll that you'll notice, maybe even in yourself, when you eat things in an unhealthy way, okay, is you're not enjoying the the bite that's in your mouth. You're thinking about the one that's mm-hmm. on the fork or the, the 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 piece that's in your hand. You ever do that? You eat something and you just it's like you, you can't even enjoy this one. You just want to get the next one. Yeah, like potato chips. Yes. <laughs> versus you and I go to dinner and somebody just makes an incredibly enjoyable meal and we're enjoying it. We're savoring it. Right. So I you know I've had alcohol, like when I was a kid, you know, when we make stupid th- decisions, not that I don't make them now, but a lot more when I was younger, where we go and the goal is to get drunk. I'm not enjoying this drink. It's like, we're just going to get drunk because I don't know, maybe I'm anxious and it's social lubricant. Who knows? Right. But versus now, if you and I go and we enjoy, I'm, I'm going to enjoy and savor what's in this glass and I'm going to enjoy the conversation. So I think that falls in line with that. Like, I don't think palatable foods are necessarily a bad thing when you respect them, you prepare them and you enjoy the company that you're with if it brings people together. So now we're talking about the balance around these types of things. And I think you can bring that all the way back to something that I said earlier. Okay. If you feed yourself if you exercise yourself, if your behaviors, if the things that you do center around self-care, then you're probably going to make a lot of balanced decisions. So if 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 I go, if you ask me, you invite me to go out to have some pizza and some beer, and I'm in the mode of self-care, I can make a very balanced decision. I can say, oh, my health hasn't been so good lately. I think I'm going to skip on that, but I'll come hang out with you. Or, yeah, you know what? I've been eating pretty good. I'm pretty healthy. I feel good. I'm going to enjoy some beer and some pizza with you. So I think the decisions you make when they come from that place, what you'll find is you'll 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 start to more naturally find a place of balance. And I think that's the root of the sustainability of a healthy lifestyle. If you don't have that, it's either going to be obsession body obsession, some kind of dysmorphia or some kind of orthorexia is really what's going to keep you consistent. And that's not healthy either. One of the things I really appreciate about your message is that you are the first person to admit that the fitness space and the health and wellness space hasn't done the best job. Mm. And in some cases done a bad job of communicating a lot of the basics that are there. And you're trying to right those wrongs, you and your team. And I think you've been doing a great job about that. And that we all have to be protective of the over-marketing, over-exaggerations, extreme polarizing views of people wanting us to demonize certain macronutrients, uh, certain you know food things, saying that you know completely stay away from processed foods. And I think that's an important message because really this is about the foundational things that we do, you know, eighty to ninety percent of the time. And then there's that aspect that's going to be our own life and the contextualization where truly, if it is actually 
10, 5% of your life, then great. Go ham and have fun and do the mm-hmm. things that you want to do. Another area, and the reason I enjoy following you on Twitter is that you are, or X now, is that you're also very vocal about being, people being protective of their minds of this onslaught of kind of, for lack of a better term, mainstream media trying to yeah. demonize the approach of health and fitness. Yeah. You made a hint to this previously, but you were talking about, you know, you can Google some of the articles that are out there, but, you know, oh, fitness and getting fit has its roots in ultra right nationalist or white nationalist. Oh, God, Another one so that bad. was there recently, Tessa, maybe if you can Google this. This is an article that was written and it was um, uh, ultra right and seed oils, right? That yeah. anybody who wants to not over consume or wants to stay away, there was a Rolling Stone article. Yeah. It was called, Why is the Right So Obsessed with Seed Oils? It's yeah. by EJ Dixon. Uh, and first of all, it's funny that that's being placed on you know the right. I have friends of all different political uh-huh. spectrums who actually have, which is what you're advocating for, a truly balanced and nuanced approach, which is that, great, do we want to be over-consuming seed oils? And typically what has a lot of seed oils? It's ultra-processed foods. Yeah, thank you, yes. Right? And it's okay to want to avoid that. And at the same time too, seed oils and having it once is not going to kill you you know, overnight. And it has, doesn't have to be this thing that plays into orthorexia. So I'm bringing all these things up because I want to give you an opportunity to sort of talk about why do you feel like it's important for you as uh, an, you know, an authority in this space to want to speak up about some of these coordinated attempts of people trying to demonize healthy approaches to living? Um, I think it's safe to say, and I think most people agree that everything these days has become politicized. And I didn't, I never thought that they would come for health and fitness. It didn't make any sense. Why, how it is, how is health and fitness political? And yet here they, here they are somehow politicizing or demonizing something that there isn't a person on the, in this world who, whose life would not improve if their health improved. Everybody's life would improve. I don't care what you believe in. If you got healthier, more mobile, more functional, your life would improve. Also, I said this earlier, Gyms are the most, people like to talk about inclusivity and non-judgmental places. Go to a gym. There is no place on earth more accepting. You go in there as an obese, out of shape, unhealthy person. Go try to exercise. The most support you'll get will be from the fanatics in that space. So it, it I, I take it very, very personal when they try to attack fitness because not only is it wrong, it's the opposite of right. All right, so let me paint the picture real quick so people can understand why this is happening, okay? I don't think it's a political party necessarily that's going after one side or the other. Some people can make that argument, but here's what it is. When people are unhealthy, they're very profitable. Go to the grocery store. Take all of the foods and products that we could label as not healthy and take all the foods and products that are labeled as healthy. Line them up. Which one makes up a bulk of the grocery store? Okay. Your consumption habits when you're unhealthy are very different than when you're healthy. It's easy to sell you a lot of products that are processed and patented when your consumption habits are based off of an unhealthy lifestyle versus healthy. What about medical costs, pharmaceuticals? Do pharmaceutical companies profit from your being healthy or from pro or profit from you being unhealthy? Look at your consumption habits with technology. When, by the way, when I say healthy, I mean healthy. I don't just mean fit because there's fit unhealthy people too. I mean healthy, like emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, you're a balanced, healthy person. What are your social media consumption habits? What are your technology consumption habits? What are your consumption habits just in general? Do healthy people have uh, shopping habits that are unhealthy? Not as much as people are unhealthy who who may buy things to fill holes or gaps in the way they feel. Um Look at your consumption habits with entertainment. I mentioned pharmaceuticals. It's in lots of markets' best interests to prevent you from becoming healthier and more fit. It's lots of markets' self-interest to take away the self-empowerment you get from being fit and healthy. 
when I'm sick now, if I were to get ill tomorrow, I am more vulnerable to manipulation. I, I am not, I don't feel as strong. I don't feel as confident. Okay. You take someone that's chronically unhealthy and you're manipulatable. You're very manipulatable. It's very easy for me to scare you into voting or buying in the way that I want. So when you see stuff like this, realize that they don't want a healthy population. They want an unhealthy population. And that's just a fact. And I don't care what market you take any market, the makeup market, the moisturizer market, the clothing market, the car market, electronics, social media, medicine, supplements, food. There's more money to make off of you when you are an unhealthy person. And again, in that entirety than when you're healthy, that's, that's, that's just a fact. So, and, and, and that's a sad fact, but that's what we're up against. And I say we, and I, I mean that as those of us who truly understand what we're up against and who are trying to really help people. You know, I didn't become a trainer to make a lot of money. By the way, that's a terrible way to make a lot of money. <laughs> One thing I love about trainers and uh, fitness coaches is that they don't do it because they're looking for honor or glory or money. It's a terrible way to do all of those things. Maybe, maybe a little bit easier now with social media, but you talk to any trainer and you ask them why they became a trainer. It's like, they, I just want to help people. I really want to help people. I, lo I love what I do. I want to help people out. Um, and that's what I did for years. I just stumbled upon this social media thing, starting a podcast that became very successful. But the reason, the, the whole goal behind it wasn't even to make a ton of money. It was like, can we reach more people with this message? We don't like the direction of the fitness industry. We were sick and tired. And I say we, cause I have co-hosts that were also trainers. We were sick and tired of having to constantly battle this with our clients. Like, can we put this message out and reach more people? So that's when you see stuff like that, like fitness is fat shaming. That's another one. That's crazy. Fat shaming. That's terrible. Now, yeah, sir, sure, some people will shame themselves into fitness, but one message you'll hear me communicate time and time again is don't work out because you hate yourself. It's a terrible way to achieve any kind of success. Do it because you care about yourself. Fitness is self-care. So I take it very personal when I see these crazy messages. By the way, people's voting habits do, and we have strong evidence to suggest that they do tend to change when people become more fit and healthy. So that may be also be why you see some of this stuff. So I went to the supermarket recently to just do a little bit of a comparison before, I, you know, because before I'm going to get the founders on my podcast, I want to make sure that the product is actually good. So even though I don't have kids myself, I did a little brief little assessment of like yeah. what's out there, the market. And I was noticing that a lot of the meal pouches that are that are currently available for for infants, it's basically like feeding your child Jamba juice. Yeah. Which, it's a lot of sugar. It's a lot of fruit, which some fruits OK, but it just doesn't seem very balanced. And you know, uh, what's the fastest thing that's growing on an infant? It's their brain. Mm. It's like incredible growth. You need a lot of fat uh, to do that. And then of course, proteins for the body and carbohydrates aren't essential. It's okay to have some, but they don't really even create the enzymes uh, at that age to break those down. So they're, so it's, it's actually healthier. I mean, if you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, we probably, you know, chewed up meat and then spit it into our baby's mouths. And that's how we fed them. Um, by the way, that's why they think you ever see a really cute baby and you grit your teeth? You get that, oh, so cute, right? Yeah. They think that that's where it comes from, is that it, that we chewed food and would give it to the baby, kind of creating baby food for them. No way. Yeah, I actually looked that up because I have that. That's like a really strong instinct. When I when I see a cute baby, I like grit my teeth <laughs> and I just want to squeeze the hell out of them. That's amazing. Yeah. I do that when I see my cat, but that's probably a different, that's probably not the same I mean, it, the roots are the same, I'm sure. The roots, yeah, yeah maybe. It's your baby. Yeah, she is my baby. But I, <laughs> what I, what I appreciate about Serenity Kids is that they're, it's a, it's a meat centric and all the meat that they incorporate, it's all like grass fed. Yeah, yeah. And it's a bone broth base. It's yep. much higher in protein and healthy fats than anything that I've seen. Yep. No, no commercial, uh, like no, no affiliation, affiliation with the company, but I just like, you know, it's the kind of food that I would probably feed my kid. Yeah. I, so we just started introducing him to some of the stuff and so far so good. He seems to love it. So it's a good time. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, you're down here in LA to, uh, talk to me about your new book, dude. I'm so excited for this book, the resistance training revolution, the no cardio way to burn fat and age proof your body in only 60 minutes a week. And I've endorsed the back of the book. You did. Thank you so much for, for, 
asking me to do that, by well, the way. Well, thank you for doing that. You got to be kidding me. Well, I mean, you're just, you're one of my favorite people in the space, if not, if, if not my favorite person in the space. Mm. Um, I mean, of course, you know, shout out to Adam, Justin, uh, love those guys too. But I just, you know, you're so reasonable, I think, in your recommendations. And what you bring under the, the hood is, you know, you've got years of experience as a personal trainer, obviously, you're a brilliant guy, you're super smart, but you also, you don't lose sight of the big picture. Mm-hmm. And that is that we all want to age better, live longer, increase our health spans. And those are all baked into the recommendations that you make. Yes. Uh, there's a, there's a huge advantage that you get from working with everyday regular people for two decades. So I, I worked with, I didn't train lots of hardcore athletes. I had some, Uh, I didn't train super extreme fitness fanatics. I had some clients like that too. Most of my clients were everyday, regular, average people looking to improve their health, their fitness, lose some weight, uh, you know, improve their longevity and mobility. And I did that for a very, very long time. And it was a a deep passion of mine. And so what you learn through that process, and this this is really an advantage that you get from doing this when you, especially when you compare yourself to researchers or people who look at studies is that you learn how to communicate uh, what's important in the right way. So to give you an example, if somebody said, hey, um, what's the best form of cardio to burn calories for me? A researcher will look to the form of cardio that burns the most calories and they'll say, oh, you should run. Now, a trainer like myself, who's worked with people for so long, I'm going to ask them another question and say, well, which one do you like the most? And that's based off of experience. I know it doesn't matter what form of exercise I recommend to you. The one that you like is the one that you're going to be most consistent at. And that goes for all the advice uh, that we talk about and that we give people is that, you know, is this really going to work? Can I communicate it in a way that it's going to be effective? And does this fit the context of this person's life and their goals? Like, is the advice I'm going to give them really going to work forever? Not just in the short term, because we have a big problem in the, in the fitness space, in the health space, in which you know we don't have a weight loss problem, people lose weight all the time. The, the problem we have is keeping it off. The problem we have is that, that maintenance. And it's not because people lack discipline. It's not because people are lazy, but rather because the way that we've been selling fitness, the way we've been communicating it is just, it's not, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for people. Unless you're a fitness fanatic, in which case you'd probably become you know, a personal trainer like me. So that's a lot of what I talk about in this book. Uh, to give you another example, the the fitness paradigm that the fitness industry has been promoting for so long is is the wrong paradigm. It's so wrong, and it's done so much damage. It's, it's it hasn't done anything to solve the problems that the fitness industry actually has the solutions to solve. If you look at the the chronic health issues that we you know can suffer from you know, obesity. And then of course, all the diseases and and chronic illnesses that come from obesity, diabetes, uh, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, um, you know, bone weakening, osteoporosis. These are all chronic things that are exploding and that actually threaten to bankrupt our societies. If any industry at all has the answers to solve that, it's the fitness and health industry. The problem is we've been promoting this, this paradigm that's totally false. And the paradigm is this, is in order to lose weight, which would improve your health because obesity is one of the big problems. In order to do that, you just need to burn more calories than you take in, or to put it differently, take in less calories uh, than you burn. Now from that, and that's, that's true. There's truth there, right? You have, that has to happen in order for you to, to, to lose body fat. And through that process, you become healthier. There's less inflammation. I mean, in a, in that type of a uh, scenario, sugar, although still not necessarily good for you, it's much better for you when you have that context. And so that's definitely very true. The problem is we've looked at exercise as this calorie burning part of the formula. So, okay, diet. Okay. We'll talk about that, but exercise well, exercise burns calories. So let's just pick the form of exercise that burns the most calories. That makes sense. Mm. The problem with that is that it actually doesn't work that way. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why. One is that the body adapts to exercise. In fact, that's one. That's what you really want to focus on. You don't want to focus on what's happening while you work out. You want to focus on how does this workout or how does this exercise teach my body or tell my body to change and adapt? And then what does that mean, right? So we've been looking at it as how many calories does this form of exercise burn? Pick the one that burns the most. And so for a long time now, for decades now, 
when talking about obesity or studying obesity or studying exercise as a way to solve some of our problems, we've always picked the calorie burning forms of exercise, which typically are cardiovascular forms of exercise. Now, cardiovascular exercise does burn a lot of calories um, during the time that you're performing it, but the adaptations that it triggers actually create a situation in which it makes fat loss harder later, uh, longer down the road, hmm. and um, it's hard to maintain. It's very hard to maintain. It's a very manual way of, of getting what you want, not to mention people don't want to exercise every single day. I mean, here's the truth. After having trained you know, hundreds or thousands of people by proxy, pe the average person we can expect realistically, and this is the truth, about two days, maybe three days a week of exercise. If we're talking long term, you know, if we're talking like my aunt or my mom or my uncle, not like me or you or you're looking at about two or three days a week is about as far as we're going to get. It's just not we're not going to get people working out five, six, seven days a week. It's not going to happen. So what can we do two or three days a week to really impact us in the most effective way possible? Well, cardiovascular exercise is a terrible approach with that. Yes, it burns calories, but it doesn't burn as much as you think. You know, an hour of hard cardio might burn 500 calories. Well, you do that twice a week. That's a thousand calories over a, a whole week. Not much. Not to mention, I mean, you know, obviously it's easy to eat a thousand calories. I mean, mm -hmm. I could eat that in five minutes. Not to mention the adaptations that cardiovascular exercise uh, causes in the body actually teach my body to burn less calories. It's teaching my body to become efficient with calorie burn. Because cardiovascular activity doesn't require much strength. So we don't need much strength to do this. Uh, we're burning a lot of calories while we're doing it. Let's reduce muscle because that actually makes us more efficient and effective at doing this activity. Mm. Wh which is why when you look at uh, like long distance runners, they have very little muscle on their bodies. Their bodies essentially have turned into these very efficient calorie machines, which in the context of modern life, you don't want that. Now, if, if we were a thousand years ago and food was very scarce, like I want my body to burn very little calories, but I want my body to burn a lot of calories because I mean, food is everywhere, right? So understanding that, like what form of exercise teaches my body to burn more calories? What form of exercise directly through the adaptation process, because the adaptation process continues with exercise through the adaptation process, what form of exercise directly combats all those all these these modern health issues that we're all going to be running into. And when you look at it that way, there's one form of exercise that stands head and shoulders above the rest and that's resistance training. Ding ding ding. Yeah, resistance training is uh superior for those things. Uh number 1, it tells your body you need to be strong. You need to have muscle. Muscle is very metabolically active it burns more calories. So now that rather than me exercising all the time to burn more calories, I could just sit here and burn more calories. I can essentially have a faster metabolism. It also, and this is uh, this is something that you're um, very knowledgeable about, muscle is one of the best ways to improve insulin sensitivity. It's one of the best ways. In fact, studies show that having more muscle, regardless of overall body mass, so you could be obese, building muscle improves insulin sensitivity. Strength training or resistance training is the only form of exercise to date that has been shown to potentially stop the progression of dementia and Alzheimer's, probably through that process of increasing insulin sensitivity and getting your body to utilize glucose or glycogen much more effectively because muscle does store some glycogen. It does utilize some of that glucose. So again, another big problem solved or potentially solved with a, a resistance training. The best part is that it doesn't need to be done all the time. In mm. fact, you know, I, I know there's people who lift weights five days a week and train quite a bit. It takes a long time to even get your body to that point. Yeah. Two days a week of, of traditional resistance training for the average person is plenty to give the kind of results and, and benefits that we're talking about. It also, there is no such thing as like permanent fitness results from exercise. It just doesn't work that way, right? You have to, whatever you do to get in shape, you have to do to stay in shape. However, again, we're looking at like regular life, right? We can expect that the average person is going to miss workouts, miss a couple weeks because of vacation. Maybe they get sick. Maybe they lose kind of their momentum and they stop working out for a month. Okay. What form of exercise protects you the longest uh, in, in terms of a period of time that you're not engaging in it? 
Again, that's resistance training. Have you heard of the term muscle memory? Yeah, of course. Okay. So it's a very real thing. Thank right? God for muscle memory. <laughs> that's right. If you've ever had a, a cast uh, on your arm or your leg and you take that cast off, you know how small the muscle is and then how fast it builds. Like To give you uh, another example, if it took me 10 years to build 10 pounds of lean body mass and then I lost it in a couple months because I was sick or whatever... I could gain that 10 pounds back within a, a couple months. So it might, it might have taken me a year to gain it the first time. I'll gain it back if I lose it afterwards very, very quickly. And there's a whole there's a, a whole complicated explanation as to why. It has to do with satellite cells that really don't go away. And But muscle memories are a very real thing. So when you do resistance training and you stop working out, first off, the muscle gains go away much slower then the maybe the stamina gains you may get from cardiovascular activity. So it doesn't it doesn't go away quite as quickly. But if it does, it comes back very fast. So mm. there was a study that was done recently where they took two groups of men. One group exercised every single week consistently. The other group exercised three weeks on, one week off. Okay. So every every three weeks they would take an entire week off and they were measuring their performance and their muscle. And as you would predict, every time they take a week off, they would dip a little bit in performance and maybe a little bit in muscle, right? But at the end of this period of this whole study, you know what they found? What? Equal muscle and strength gains. So even though they took a week off every three weeks, at the end of the this 16-week stu study, they had built just as much strength and muscle as the other group. So it just it, it just goes to show you the resilience that resistance training really provides your body. And I can't think of a better time to utilize that, which is right now. So we always have to consider the context of things. You know, anytime a client would try to hire me and ask me questions, I would always have to understand your goals and how many days a week you can realistically work out all the time. And what are we working with? And what do you like? And context is very, very important. And when we understand the context of what's going on right now, it's, it's resistance training. Other stuff I cover in the book really is is the the stigma and the stereotype that is damaged um, a lot of people's health because they don't even think to go do resistance training or strength training. You like, know, what are some of the misconceptions that you would say you know uh, in, s define that stigma? Like, what 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 is that about? Yeah, so um, you know, resistance training is make me big and bulky. Uh, mm. This is really especially for women. Oh, if I if I do resistance training, I get big and bulky because that's that's false. Um, it's actually quite hard to build muscle. Also, muscle's very dense. So if you're watching this right now and, you know, if I had, if I could magically snap my fingers and make you lose five pounds of fat, but gain five pounds of muscle. So your weight is the same on the scale. You'd actually be much smaller. You'd have a smaller waist. You'd have smaller legs. You'd be much tighter and more compact. So muscle's very, very dense. Doesn't take up much uh, space. Um, that's number one. And it gives you shape. This is what resistance training does. In fact, uh, years ago when I managed uh, a big box gym, I used to have this trainer that worked for me. And she was 5'1". She loved to lift weights. Very fit, very sculpted, very toned. She didn't look crazy or anything like that. And she weighed about 140 pounds. And I would call her into my office anytime I was talking to a, a potential member. It was a woman who would always, you know, they would always express like, I don't want to do weights because I don't want to get big. I call this trainer in. So I do like the, on the intercom, you know, attention, <laughs> you know, staff, you know, so-and-so please come to Sal's office. She would walk in and then I'd say, uh, can you guess, and I'll give you 10 pounds, guess how much she weighs. And they would all say, oh, I don't know, 105, 110. Then we'd say, we'd get her on the scale and they'd see she was 140 pounds. It would blow their minds wow. because muscle, you don't look huge with a little bit of muscle on your body. You look tight and sculpted. So that's one of the big ones. But and I think we, I still think women don't want to see a uh, just they don't want to see a higher number on the scale. We got to get rid of the scales. Yeah. It's such a um uh yeah, I I I get how it's a metric, but by itself it doesn't mean a whole lot. Um for example, I could cut my leg off and I lost weight. Uh, not the kind of weight that I'd want to lose, right? Body composition is what matters. So we have BMI, for example, which BMI is correlated to, you know, all these health issues. But if we compared that to body fat percentage, we'd see a far more accurate uh, measure, far more accurate. Really, it's about body composition. I mean, I'm my body weight places me at a higher BMI, but my body fat percentage is is quite low. So that's what, really what we want to what we want to look at. Um, so there's that. And we could talk about the roots of that uh, a little bit later, why that became the way it is. Then you have like the 
oh, resistance training uh, is going to make me stiff. It's going to it's going to take away from my flexibility. This is also not true. Hmm. Proper full range of motion resistance training is the best form of exercise, best form of exercise for improving functional flexibility. So what's functional flexibility? So flexibility on its own is just range of motion. So how far can I stretch my arm back? Okay. Functional flexibility is do I own that range of motion? Do I have strength in that range of motion? So to give you another example, a baby has tremendous flexibility. So like my five month old, I mean, I could take his foot and put it by his head and put him in the splits. No problem. Does that mean that he's stable? Does that mean his joints are safe? Well, no. If I if I bend his leg over and put a little load on him, he'd probably dislocate one of his joints and injure himself. So uh, functional flexibility is what you want. You want to have the kind of mobility to where I can twist, reach, grab, squat, but I can do so with my own body weight or even with load. If my kid jumps on me or if I go to grab something. Resistance training provides us because when you're training in full ranges of motion, you're doing so with resistance. And of course, you have to do it appropriately. So you want to train within a range of motion that you own, but you can continue to challenge that range of motion and get better and better. And what you do is you start to own it. So now we have studies that actually show that for that kind of flexibility, for mobility and for stability, resistance training is at least as good, but better, usually better than the the typical stretching forms of exercise that we would attribute to good flexibility, like yoga for yeah. example. So it's phenomenal uh, for that. Um, here's another one. For heart health, uh, you should do cardiovascular activity, <laughs> not resistance training. Okay, this is actually false. We now have studies that show that for heart health, uh, resistance training is actually superior. Cardiovascular activity is good too. And by the way, I want to I want to let everybody know that all forms of exercise, so long as they're done appropriately, have value. So I'm not saying don't do other forms of exercise. They all have value. All I'm saying is if you had to pick one or you're like the average person, um, then resistance training is the one that you should make the cornerstone of your routine. It's just going to give you the most bang for your buck. But again, the study showed that when it came to heart health, resistance training was superior. And again, it probably had to do with the fact that your insulin sensitivity is much better, reduces inflammation, and your body is slowly turning into kind of this fat burning machine. Um, in fact, if you look at the, as a trainer or anybody, anybody that's works in, if you're watching this and you've worked in gyms before, you know what I'm talking about. People who make cardiovascular activity, running, cycling, whatever, the cornerstone of the routine when, they, when they're looking for weight loss, typically what they'll notice is they'll get this initial fast weight loss, then this hard plateau, mm. right? So, uh, you know, oh, I lost 10 pounds and then nothing. Now my metabolism has adapted. Things right. have slowed down. Um, in order to lose any more body fat now or weight, I should say, I have to do more or cut my calories even more. And by the way, studies confirm this. The weight that you do lose with that form of exercise is usually half muscle, half body fat. So uh, you're actually not getting leaner. You're just getting smaller. Yikes. So uh, in, in other words, if you're if you lose 10 pounds and half is muscle, half is fat, your body fat percentage has actually stayed the same. I've actually seen people lose weight and their body fat percentage go up. Wow. Because they lost more muscle than body fat. Remember, it's, it's a percentage of your body weight. That's what's important, right? So, you know, I may be lean at 210 pounds, but if you took my body fat and put it on a five foot person, it'd probably be a lot more because they have so much less body mass. So they're actually exercising their way to being skinny fat. Absolutely. That's insane. 100%. So so they'll, they'll they'll notice this quick drop and then this hard plateau. Now with resistance training, you notice a slower weight loss, but then it starts to snowball. As the metabolism kicks in, as things start to work, you get the snowball effect. And then you get to this point where you're doing it consistently for four, five, six months. And you're like, this is weird. I'm eating more than I did before. And I'm just getting leaner. And those are the kind of comments that I would get from clients that come to me and be like, this is Sal, I'm eating more food. I'm getting leaner. I'm only working with you two days a week or three days a week. Like, this is really strange. You're like, what's going on here? I'm like, well, your metabolism is really, you know, kicking into gear. So, uh, so back to the heart health, it does a tremendous job for heart health. We talked about the brain. You want to talk about brain health? Again, now we have studies that show that it's so far, again, there's only form of exercise that actually has halted. Um, what the, the, the things that happen that turn into Alzheimer's or dementia, 
resistance training. And they think it has to do with the insulin sensitivity and the, the way the body utilizes, you know, gly, uh, glucose. I, I know that uh, some researchers refer to Alzheimer's and dementia as type three diabetes. Yeah, it's shocking. Uh, yeah, because of that, right? Um, so there you go. So, and, and there's so many more. I mean, bone health, this is very obvious. Uh, if you're building muscle, you're building bone. There's no form of exercise that'll stop or reverse osteopenia um, like resistance training. There's just nothing, nothing like it. Um, brain health from a di- here's from a different standpoint. Proprioceptive ability. Hmm. That's the that's knowing where my body is in space, right? Most forms of exercise are very repetitive. So if I run, it's the same motion. If I walk, it's the same motion. If I cycle, if I Resistance training is just, there's an almost infinite number of movements and exercises and ways to position my body. It's not one of those types of workouts that I could just not think about while I'm doing. You're focused, you're there, you're present, you're placing your feet down, you're moving in a particular way with intention and control. And so it really does develop those parts of the brain that have to do with body awareness and balance you know, better than other forms of exercise. And, you know, part of the challenge has been that the studies on exercise that we've done, you know, now for the last four or five decades, the vast majority of them, if it had to do with health, it was done with cardiovascular exercise usually. Right. It was almost never done with resistance training. Why is that? Partially because resistance training really was relegated to weightlifting Mm. and athletic performance. So if they did a study on athletic performance or strength, then you would sometimes see resistance training. But but if it had to do with health, like, oh, how does exercise improve blood pressure or blood lipid levels? Or how does exercise help with cognition? They almost never picked resistance training. So these other forms of exercise got all this amazing publicity through these studies. Resistance training had no studies. I also think like from a basic science standpoint, it's a lot easier to get an animal to do cardiovascular or, That's you a, know, quote unquote aerobic exercise uh, than it is to get an animal to, to lift weights. That's, that's a not, not a bad point. I didn't even think of that. Absolutely. Now though, we are seeing a lot of studies on resistance training and it's starting to really open up. Um, for example, there, if you, a simple strength test is one of the best single metrics that can predict all-cause mortality. Yeah, even like grip strength, That's which it. is sort of a, like a surrogate proxy marker for full-body vigor. Yeah, I don't, it, know how, I don't know how tightly that's correlated, but you know, if you're if you have a weak grip, that's probably a pretty good sign that you're a, that you're frail. That's what the studies show. So, like, you know, if you want to predict all cause mortality, it's obviously best to have multiple yeah. tests and parameters. But Data if points, yeah. But if you just had one. Believe it or not, strength, testing someone's strength is actually one of the most accurate predictors. And they, they do it either through grip or a simple, can you get up off the floor without having to grab onto something test? Wow. That's it. And they can actually predict all-cause mortality relatively accurately with that versus even testing your blood lipids or your or your blood pressure. So it's, it's pretty incredible. And if you look at what's happened to us with our modern lives, we're so sedentary yet we're so busy, right? So it's not like we're not doing anything. We got ske- things are so scheduled all the time. And I got to take the kids here and I got a job and then I'm going to do this and then so we're very sedentary, uh, but we're also very busy and we're just weak. We're very weak. We don't have much strength. We don't have much muscle. And muscle is in is such an incredible protect it's it's like a it's like a suit of armor that hmm. protects you against chronic disease against, uh, you know, uh, degeneration of the brain or the joints. And we have none of it. And then what, what do we do? We tell people here, you want to exercise, go do this form of exercise that is going to make you not build any muscle or maybe even lose a little bit of muscle. So it's no, it's no wonder people work out and they're like, this isn't working for me. Why, why am I not getting good results? I lost some weight for the first month and now I'm where I'm at and I'm not eating very much and it's just not working for me. Um, here's another good point. Hormones. So, uh, recently we're starting to really, uh, you're starting to see this now in mainstream. We're talking about the kind of the testosterone, uh, epidemic that we're seeing in men. So testosterone levels are just, they've been declining for, for decades now. So Mm -hmm. I believe the last statistic I saw showed that a 20, like a 26 year old male, I think it's 26 year old male today on average, has the testosterone levels of a 60-year-old male in the, in the 80s, just wow. to give you an example of, of what's happening. 
No form of exercise reliably raises testosterone like resistance training. Mm. In fact, resistance training not only raises low testosterone, but it raises high testosterone. So no matter where your testosterone levels are, you're going to get higher levels typically if you train uh, with resistance uh, properly. It also increases androgen receptor density. Wow. So androgen receptors are the receptors that testosterone will attach to. In fact, they did a study where they were trying to see if how strongly correlated testosterone levels were to strength and muscle gains. So they took men and they had them work out and they tested their testosterone. And they found that natural, so long as it was within a healthy parameter, a healthy range, that the testosterone levels actually didn't make a big difference. It was the androgen receptor density that made the big difference. So mm. the men with the higher density of androgen receptors just built more muscle and had faster results than the people with the you know with with fewer androgen receptor uh, density or with less, I should say. Resistance training increases uh, androgen receptor density uh, quite reliably. In women, it's it balances out estrogen and progesterone mm. uh, again quite reliably. And it's probably because resistance training of all forms of exercise, it's a pro tissue form of exercise. Other forms of exercise, not so much. In fact, other forms of exercise, directly speaking, are probably more of a anti-tissue uh, forms of exercise. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by pro-tissue and anti-tissue? So again, if we look at exercise as a stimulus, mm -hmm. how's this stimulus? Because remember, when you're when you're doing any form of exercise, and it's challenging. It's a stress on the body, and that that makes your body want to adapt in order to avoid future stress from the same type of insult, right? So if I'm running and I'm, my lungs are burning, it's really challenging, my body's like, this is a stress. Let's improve our stamina so that uh, next time this is no longer a stress. And then, of course, what do you do? You run longer or run harder and kind of continue that process. Same thing with resistance training or any other uh, form of exercise. So when you exercise with resistance – the stress on the body says, we need more strength. The direct result of that is building muscle. So it's mm. pro-tissue, mm. right? Other forms of exercise, uh, like running, for example, as I'm running, burning lots of calories, also telling my body, we need to become more efficient with calories. So it's reducing tissue. It's wow. taking away. And now think about the hormones that are associated with building muscle and then the hormones that are associated with taking it away, right? So- you have like cortisol and stress hormones versus like testosterone or a balance of, or and growth hormone or a balance of estrogen and progesterone. So like when I would get clients that were women who had hormone issues um, and I would always work with a functional medicine practitioner, uh, resistance training was just, it was just superior. I'd have them come in and oftentimes these women were not getting enough sleep or lots of stress, maybe under eating fats. That was quite common. So we'd kind of fix some of that stuff. And then I would train them and the routine would be this very traditional straight set, you know, compound lift type resistance training uh, routine. So they come see me and we would, I would, you know, get them to get good at squats and deadlifts and presses and rows. And they'd work with me, you know, a couple days a week and we would rest you know, two minutes in between sets, because the goal again is to send the right signal, not necessarily burn a ton of calories during the workout. And you would, they would get tremendous results. And I would compare that to women who would work with a functional medicine practitioner and then go do like hit classes or Zumba or spin classes. And at some point the, their functional medicine doctors would say, stop, that is not helping. It's actually making this much more challenging. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's really bad. It's, it's terrible that Again, because here's my goal with the book, right? And, and, and the way I communicate this in the book is very much, it's very easy to understand. And my goal with it is to get to the point where, you know, the average person is, I don't know, they go to the doctor and the doctor looks at their cholesterol or whatever and says, you know, you should probably exercise. And then they think to themselves, I think I'll go lift some weights. Yeah. That's the goal. As opposed to I'll start, you know, I'll take up jogging. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so that's really the, the, the focus of it. Um, and I talk a little bit about the history of resistance training. We get into some nutrition stuff as well. Um, again, as a trainer, when it comes to nutrition, I focus more on encouraging the behaviors that lead to, uh, you know, better eating versus the the mechanisms of nutrition. Like, so you're not just all about calorie deficits. No. <laughs> I mean, it's, this is the, again, this is the problem. You know, when you have the, the, the scientists and researchers who are trying to communicate how to solve this problem, 
they don't know how to communicate it. All they can tell you are the are the mechanisms. And we've been told burn more calories, eat less calories forever. Yeah. It's totally failing. Well, it's just not a weight loss strategy. It's not irrelevant, but it's not a str- it doesn't give people the the tools to know how to proceed. I was, you know, we were talking earlier before we started rolling. To me, it's the same as telling somebody who's telling a person with obesity that a calorie deficit is the way to a healthier weight is the same thing to me, identical to telling somebody who's stuck in poverty that the way to get out of poverty is with a money surplus. (laughs) It's like, thanks, Sherlock. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, but you have a money, you have a money imbalance. You have a money imbalance. You know what your problem is? Yeah. Yeah, I I, I just did a study. (laughs) You just need to take in more money than you spend. No, that's 100% correct. Um, to, so I'll give you an example, right? If you, you could tell somebody, Hey, look, in order to lose weight, you just need to eat less calories. Okay. So I want you to cut your calories or you could tell someone, Hey, I tell you what, don't worry about your calories. Don't worry about anything else. Here's what I want you to do. Every time you eat, make sure you're not on your phone. You're not watching TV. You're not reading a book. Make sure you're sitting down and you're focused on just your meal. And you might be thinking, what, what the hell does that have to do with, with weight loss? Non-distracted eating actually results in fewer calories uh, that we tend to consume. You, when you're distracted, you eat way more. Fifteen percent more calories. Yeah. Actually, yeah, it's a fact. So what I'm what I'm doing is I'm communicating in ways that will help with the behavior. So now this person, because now why is that why is that different? Well, here's why: when you tell someone to count your calories, eat less, it's it's a mentally starts to get very challenging. I'm hungry. I want to eat. Uh, what's going on? If we tell someone, hey, just sit down and eat. Don't worry about your food. Just eat whatever. But just sit down and. Don't go on your phone. Don't watch TV. Okay, I can do that. And then they don't feel deprived. They don't feel like they're cutting anything. And then they come to you and they go, I've done this with clients too, where I'll say, you know, I don't want you to watch your calories. I don't want you to, let's not change anything. Just, just do that. And they'll say, okay, that's kind of weird, but I'll do it. And then, then, you know, after a month or two, we'll see fat loss and they'll come to me and be like, I didn't know that my phone was making me fatter. I was like, well, it's not necessarily your phone. It's just the behaviors that it encourages. So, and they'll, but I, I'm eating like I normally do. And I was like, actually, you think you're eating like you normally do, but what you don't realize is you're eating less calories because you're not distracted. You know, another example would be just not eating heavily processed food. Just doing that alone, you're going to eat, you know, I don't know, 500 calories less a, a day. So, you know, those are the ways that we, I communicate nutrition in the book is really through behavior, which in my experience, is the only long-term successful way I've ever gotten anybody uh, to to their goals in a in a real forever way. It's never been through counting calories and counting macros. It just doesn't it just doesn't work long term. The only people that works long term for are are fitness fanatics or orthorexics. I never had a normal person, you know, uh, watch their calories and macros, and then I meet up with them five years later, and it's oh yeah, it's going great. It's never, it's always, you know, uh, you know, I went off of it or, you know, I wanted to enjoy my, my day. I want to enjoy my life. And so I kind of stopped doing it. I need to get back onto it. And when I focused on behaviors, I would see them five years later and a good majority would be like, oh yeah, I'm doing great. It's actually quite easy. I feel like I'm not even trying. So you've seen a lot of instances over the course of your career where people actually rebound. They lose weight in the short term and then they blow back up. The, the the statistics are they say eighty percent. Um, I would say it's probably closer to ninety five percent. So wow. so the, the it's it fails. It fails almost every single time. It fails because we're trying to manually burn calories, which is a terrible approach. You can't burn that many calories uh, through working out, just through the process of working out. And your your meta- and if you if you go with that approach, like I said earlier, your metabolism eventually adapts. I last time I was on your show, I talked about that study with the Hadza tribe. They did another study with, in the Amazon where they compared children in rural areas to children in less rural areas, and they wanted to see what the calorie burn difference was. And the reason why they they took those two groups was because kids in rural areas are just moving way more. They're working way more. Kids in the more modern areas are sitting down on the computers or whatever. And they thought, much like the Hadza study, they thought they would see this huge calorie burn uh, difference. And what they found wasn't that. They found wow. that they burned similar amounts of calories because- our bodies have to adapt that way. There's no way we would have survived in evolution if we burned 6,000 calories a day because I had to chase down my food or I had to go forage or whatever. There's no way. My body slowly adapts. So knowing this, again, what form of exercise can I hack? What form of exercise can I use to tell my body to do the opposite because I want you know, that faster metabolism? So, so 
we're trying to burn calories rather than teach our body to burn more calories. When it comes to diet, we're, we're worried about calories and grams of proteins and fats and carbs. And that approach is, is not, is not going to work. Look at your behaviors. How can we, how can we incorporate things into our life that encourages behaviors that makes me naturally eat better? See, here's the problem. If I'm constantly focused on trying to eat healthy, I'm going to fail. Eventually, my willpower is going to be gone. You know, motivation is, uh, it's a state of mind. Mm. And like all states of mind, it comes and it goes. You know, I've never had to talk a client who's motivated into eating right and exercising. It's just, it just happens. The trouble is when that motivation goes away, like it always does, right? So what are things I can do in my life that will just n make it natural for me? So I'll give you one more example. Um, we all have, I don't know, for lack of a better term, trigger foods, right? Foods that we just tend to overeat. I know for me, it's uh, potato chips. If there's potato chips in the house, <laughs> I'm going to eat them, right? For my wife, it's chocolate. So I would tell this to clients. I'd say, look, here's the deal. You can eat those things. I know you love your potato chips. You can eat them. They just can't be in the house. So I said, well, what do you mean? I'd say, well, if you really want them, tell yourself they're not in the house, but if you really want them, you'll drive to the store and buy yourself a single serving of those chips. And, but then you can eat them. So don't worry about it. And they'd say, really? Yeah, yeah that's it. Just do that. And now what am I doing when I, when I tell them to do that? All I'm doing is I'm creating a barrier between them and their impulse. That's it. These foods that we tend to overeat, these trigger foods, they tend to be impulsive behaviors. We tend to eat them mindlessly. Um, in fact, you know, what's, would you have a trigger food? Oh my God. I've got, I've got a few. I mean, I, chocolate is definitely one of them. I like, uh, they have these like paleo puff kind of food, you know, like snacks that are, um, they're like Cheetos almost, but they, have, I know what those are. Yeah. They have, they have like healthier ingredients, they're like cassava but they're flour. Not healthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 A lot of those, like those cassava flour based chips, um, that have somewhat better for you ingredients. But for me, if I'm opening up a whole huge bag that has 14 or whatever servings in it, to me, that's a serving. Yeah. yeah. That's my serving. So next time you're eating that, if you, if you can, you know, find the state of mind to pause, what you'll find is when you're eating these types of foods, it's not even about the, 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 the bite that's in your mouth. It's about the one you're holding in your hand. It's the <laughs> next one, right? So it's not even like, even though I'm chewing and tasting the food, I'm trying to get this one in. And then when that one's in there, it's about the next one. So it's this very impulsive type of behavior. In extreme cases, when people binge, it's, they, it's how fast can I get this in my mouth. And it's not even about the food that I'm tasting. It's really about this, this kind of impulsive behavior. So by creating barriers between you and that behavior, it gives you a space to become aware of what's going on. You don't even have to try, by the way, to become aware. If you just create a barrier that oftentimes a person will, you know, oh, I want chips. Oh, okay. I can drive the store and maybe they'll do it. Maybe they'll drive the store. Maybe the next time, They'll say, do I really want to drive the store? Or on the way to the store, like, God, I'm driving to the store to get potato. Do I really want? I know why. I'm stressed. That's why I'm doing this. And so it starts to encourage better behaviors. Much better approach to nutrition is how do I, what foods encourage behaviors that make me overeat? Um, what are some barriers I can put between myself and these impulsive uh, you know, types of things that I'm doing? What kinds of foods are tend to be more satiating? Food order. This is a good one. Um, we know that protein is very satiating, yeah. right? So why don't we do this? Why don't we eat that first in our meal? What if we told people, hey, I know you're going to have this big meal. Eat a big serving of protein first. And then I used to do this with clients too. I would say, I wouldn't tell them to take anything away. I'd say, um, okay, here's what I want you to do. Mrs. Johnson, you weigh 130 pounds. I want you to eat hundred grams of protein a day. I don't care about anything else. Hit your protein requirements and let's not worry about, you can eat everything else like you normally would or whatever. Just make sure you hit a hundred grams every single day. Now I knew that if she did that, she would eat less. And sure enough, every single time. And it's funny because they'd come to me and they'd say, I don't know, all, eating all this protein made me burn fat. Well, not necessarily. It's just, it makes you eat less Yeah, because you're prioritizing a macronutrient that just makes you full. And so this is kind of the approach that uh, that, that you'll find long-term success. Here's a, here's a tip that I do. Um, so there's nothing like 
intrinsically wrong with ice cream, right? And ice cream is like one of the most pleasurable foods that exist, right? So you wouldn't want to deprive somebody of ice cream for the entirety of their life, right? Ice right. cream is just like one of the things that humans have come up with that just like, it, it's like sex, right? Yes. Um, although we, we didn't come up with sex. We were, you know, <laughs> we, we inherited that. Um, but so here's a, here's a trick that I use. It's obviously very easy to eat more than a serving of ice cream if you have a pint of ice cream sitting in front of you, right? But what if you were to buy an ice cream pop, like a popsicle, like an ice cream, I don't know, what are they popsicles? Yeah, like sure. That? Yeah, portion controls built into that, right? So it's a lot easier, I think, to, um, to, to portion control when you're eating an ice cream pop because then you have to make that mental, if you want to go, if you want to consume more than that single portion, you've got to actually like convince yourself to go and get another ice pop and then you're gonna feel like a bit of a glutton, right? Yeah. If you, if you, have, if you go for the second ice pop, but, um, but by eating that, you're portion controlled. Whereas if you have the, just a pint of ice cream sitting in front of you, in front of you, uh, or even if you take it out of the freezer and you're scooping it into the into the you know your dessert bowl, we're always going to be more inclined to put more than a serving in it. So go instead, instead of buying pints of ice cream, buy the ice cream popsicles because portion control is built in. That, and so it, whenever you're using yes. you know eating a snack or whatever, like even paleo puffs, which is like a, a food for me, where if I if that's a trigger food, if I open up the bag of paleo puffs, I'm going to eat the whole bag. Mm -hmm. Now they have uh, smaller bags of it. So I would be more inclined to buy that where I know I'm not going to eat two bags. You know, I'm not going to eat two bags of the smaller. I'll just eat one because it's already portion controlled out for me. And there's that friction. There's that, that, barrier. that barrier. You create that barrier. So yeah. you might, and I've done that. I've actually told clients to do that where I'll say, um, okay, buy single servings. You go ahead and buy a bunch of them. Yeah. But when you go take it to the couch or when you go take it to go sit down, take one. Yeah. If you want more, you got to walk back and get another one. And, and it's not that it works every single time. Cause there's going to be those situations where you do go back and get one or two or three more, but they, there will be enough times to where you pause and go, eh, do I really want another one? Eh, I think I'm okay. <laughs> and that's all you need. Yeah. That's all you need. Um, it, it also our approach towards nutrition and exercise. We, we have to, we have to start from a positive place rather than a negative place. You, you would be surprised at how much more effective it is when somebody says, um, you know, I'm eating right and I'm exercising because I want to take care of myself versus um, I'm eating right and I'm exercising because I hate the way I look or I'm too fat, right? It's very, very different. One of them feels good. One of them feels bad. It's no wonder that people stop their diet or their routine and say things like, I just want to enjoy my life. I've had people tell me that before. Like, mm. why, why did you stop exercising? Oh, you know, I just want to enjoy my life. And we know the reality is you'll enjoy your life more because you're fit and healthy. You have a better quality of life. But they they went at it from this kind of negative, insecure place. And and I will partially blame the fitness space for that. It's it's a very powerful way to sell products. It's so much easier. When you learn marketing, and you know, I, 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 I own a media company, a fitness media company, and... We'll hear marketing teams that we work with say this all the time. What are the pain points, right? Give, make sure you have a pain point because that's what gets people to, to buy your product or whatever. And it's true. It, it gets people to buy because we want to run away from pain. But it's a very ineffective way of staying the course and staying consistent. Nobody wants to hate themselves forever. Or look, if you hate your body, what is exercise? Punishment. Exercise is punishment. If you hate your body, what is eating right? It is restricting me. It's taking things away. If I'm doing these things because I want to take care of myself, what is exercise? Exercise is a form of care. What is nutrition? What is proper nutrition? A form of care. Who doesn't want to take care of themselves, right? So it's a very, very different approach. And the results are so much, so much better, especially in the long term, in fact, in the long term, you find that people enjoy it more and more. You start to say, hear people like I would hear clients say, "Yeah, I really need to go to the gym. I need to, you know, I really enjoy it there." Like, wow, I'm, you know, I'm hearing these people say that they enjoy it, that they want to do this, versus oh, I got to go to the gym and beat myself up or whatever. Yeah, dude, I love going to the gym. I love having a good workout, and I focus primarily on resistance training. And it's been for, I mean, 20 years at this point. It's been. Uh, it's been like a home for me. You know, mm -hmm. I go to the gym and I, sometimes I'll put my headphones in. Sometimes I go without, but I just, I love it so much. The benefits that I get to my mental health, um, 
you know, what I see in the mirror, just the, the feeling good looking in the mirror mm -hmm. shirtless after you get a pump in the gym, <laughs> it just makes you feel good. It does. Because you see the change like that. You do. You, you do. You see it. You see the change. And I, you know, I, I, I really want, you know, in the, in the seventies, there was a, a book that was published called the, I think it's called the complete book of running. If I show you the cover, you'll recognize it. it's like a, it's like a leg and like a red running shoe. Mm. And it was like, everybody owned it. And it ushered in the running uh, revolution. You know, before that, if you went outside, you didn't see anybody running. It was like you go out in the sixties and early seventies or before you wouldn't see people jogging. It just didn't just never happened. Wow. All of a sudden it became this huge craze and everybody started lacing up their shoes and going out and run. I want that to happen with resistance training. I want the average person to really understand this is not a workout just for bodybuilders or weightlifters. Hmm. This is the kind of workout. If you just want to get in, Fit. If you just want to burn body fat, if you just want to be lean, if you just want to improve your cognitive performance or your health, and you only have a couple days a week, and realistically, you know, probably not going to work out more than a couple days a week, that's the form of exercise you should probably pick. That's the one that's going to do the best. And it doesn't matter if you're old, young, male, or female, that's the form of exercise that's going to, it's going to give you way more bang for your buck, especially the longer you do it, especially the more consistent you are with it over time you just get those accelerating results i completely agree with you i think it's almost like a panacea resistance training it's it's so great for you i mean we we're talking about all the signaling all the hormonal changes everything that it does for your brain you know i did a, a, an episode of the podcast recently where we we're talking about myokines these, these mm -hmm. chemicals that are produced in your muscles like brain derived neurotrophic factor bdnf that go up to your brain and, and support neuroplasticity the birth of new brain cells the the hormonal signaling testosterone what that does for your well-being. One really interesting line of research that I actually I'm kind of enamored with because I think it's so empowering. They've done these studies, and I'm sure you're you're familiar with them, where they'll take a person and they'll let them, they'll make them work out one leg. Yep. And they'll see that there's improvements in strength in the other leg. Correct. Yeah. So if you if you break your arm and you're let's say you work out regularly and you break your arm and you think, oh, I don't want to work out my other arm because there's going to be such a difference. The reality is training the other side will actually prevent a certain amount of muscle loss and strength loss in the emo in the arm that is being casted up. That's amazing. Yeah, so you, so you get this localized effect from exercise or from resistance training. You also get this systemic effect throughout the whole body. You know, what, one more thing I, I want to touch on because uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure at this point people are, are watching and saying, okay, I'm going to go work out. I'm going to go maybe lift some weights or whatever, which would be great. But one more thing I want to say is, and I think this is true for all forms of exercise, uh, but we're talking about resistance training. So you are much better off treating your workouts like practice than you are treating them like workouts. So uh, I'll give you some examples of what I mean. So years ago, and this is this this the way I'm communicating this came to me years ago. I was I was on a hike, and there were runners up in the hills, and I got passed up by a couple runners. And as a trainer, it's just it's impossible for me not to notice someone's biomechanics. It's just natural, right? <laughs> so I'm seeing people run by me and I'm like, oh my God, this, this feet are pronating so bad. Or, oh my gosh, <laughs> I could see like an anterior pelvic tilt that's going to hurt their back. And, and I'm noticing people run by. And then there was someone that ran by that looked like they were just gliding, right? And then it dawned on me. Was it Aaron Alexander? No, it wasn't. <laughs> although, although I've seen that guy moving. He does move like that. <laughs> and, and, and it dawned on me. The reason why people do that is because we treat exercise when it comes to exercise, it's all about the workout portion. So why are you running or why are you squatting or why are you bench pressing or whatever? It's to get, it's to get sweaty and to get sore. Really it's the way we need to look at it is it's a skill and I need to perfect and practice the skill. First off, if I treat it like that, I'm going to train more appropriately. My intensity is going to be more appropriate, but I'm also going to continue to get better at that skill and over time, I'm not going to get injuries. I'm going to feel good. So if somebody, for example, said, you know, I want to start running. I haven't run since I was 10 years old. I'm going to go practice running. Well, what, what they would do is they would start slow. They wouldn't run to fatigue because the first thing that happens when you get tired is your form goes out the window. Yep. And they would slowly, over time, perfect the skill of running. That's how I tell people to, to do resistance training in my book. I say, look, you go to the gym or work it at home. I actually provide uh, workouts at home without equipment, uh, workouts with bands, 
and then workouts with dumbbells and barbells. I say, look, when you do these workouts, rather than thinking I'm going to make my legs sore, or I'm going to really burn my shoulders out, whatever, practice these movements. Go in and think, practice, practice, get really perfect with this. Uh, the results you get from that are just superior, just superior. Uh, in the short term, you get great results. In the long term, for sure, though, because your form gets better. You don't hurt yourself. You're always mindful of the technique of the exercise rather than how how much it hurts. And, you know, there's one one myth that I'd like to to, to talk about here with exercise, which is that getting sore is like this, this great metric of a successful workout. It's actually a terrible metric. Uh, it getting, you, you actually probably should not get sore from your workouts, or if you do, it should be very, very minor mm. excessive soreness means you did too much. It just did. So wow. your goal is when you work out, you'll feel, maybe feel it a little bit or not at all. And that's how, you know, you're, you're doing okay. If you get really sore, like, Oh my God, I worked out yesterday, my legs and I can't walk for two days. You, you, you went too hard and in doing it in that way, will just get your body to prioritize healing over adaptation. So you're no, you're not building strength or muscle or whatever, or improving your performance, your body's just, it's just prioritizing. I need to heal. I need to just, you know, heal this tissue. And so you end up doing this thing where you, you get sore, heal, get sore, heal, get sore, heal, and you never improve. I never get stronger. I never see my body change. I'm just damaging and healing my body. So treat your workouts like practice and you'll do much better. That's amazing. And you don't even have to use super heavy weights, right? No. No, 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 no. Your body actually has no idea how much weight you're lifting. It just knows tension. So I could take, uh, allow your form to dictate the weight that you use. And then if you want to increase the tension, I would say focus on your form. Slow down your tempo. Uh, focus on the muscles that you're trying to feel. Um, that's going to give you, it, it would be like adding weight minus the increased risk of you know, adding weight, right? Yeah. Now, if you get stronger and your technique is good and your tempo is good and you add weight, that's also good. Yeah. We used to think that there was a relatively narrow effective rep range for muscle hy hypertrophy, for strength gain. Mm -hmm. But now we know it's a lot, it's a lot more sort of forgiving and broader than that. Right? I talk about that in the book, right? Yeah. So um, all rep ranges within reason. So one rep to let's say 30 or 40 reps, right? They all build strength and build muscle. So you might think, well, why why stay in one rep range or another? What's the what's the difference? Well, besides the specific adaptations, like if you're a power lifter, you're probably going to spend more time in the in the one to five rep range because your goal is to compete and lift as much weight as possible for one rep. Yeah. Or you know maybe you want more strength stamina, um, so you're going to do higher reps. Besides that, really, what you should do if you're just looking for overall fitness and health is to train in all rep ranges. Hmm. Um, and the best way to do that is to phase your workouts. So you would do something like three or four weeks in the six to eight rep range. And then I'm going to move now in the next three to four weeks to the 15 to 20 rep range. And this just gets the body to, it's a new, it's a novel stimulus and it gets the body to, to uh, progress in a more consistent, perpetual way. You know, you stay in the same rep range all the time. The stimulus becomes less and less effective and you don't get as consistent of results versus moving out in and out of different rep ranges and it's usually about three or four weeks is why i recommend people to to do that all right i know you like that episode if you did check this one out 30 percent body fat for men this is way too high this is actually a bit high for women as well so in today's episode we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10 what is 10 percent body fat this is when you have a visible six pack can you go from 30 to 10 percent yes it's possible but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right, of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body.